We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andrew and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. I haven't asked in a long time, how's Daisy doing? She's very well. I could go get her. She's asleep, but she's Don't very well. Her. She's big. Oh, that's she's good. Or- she's quite orange. Oh. <laughs> she, she turned quite orange. But well, yes, quite expecting did- orange. Uh, I was. I mean, she was slightly orange when we got her. I mean, okay. She had a little bit of orange, but then she she's very orange now. But she is she is settled in and she's happy. I need to figure out, and I I I probably should just ask somebody about the claws because uh-huh. they are substantial at this point mm. and painful. So I like to I like her hanging out with me, but she tries to crawl up the back of my head, which is just ooh, and if she fall if she starts falling off sure, me, she yeah. latch on of and course. then. <laughs> I had like the I had like four like 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 six scratches on my arm where both of her claws were digging in as she was trying to keep herself from falling off at one point. But what ebbs? Uh, it's worth it. So anyways, I, I take her I take her outside sometimes, but she generally hangs out in her uh, terrarium and in, and in the house. You know, she'll go that, whatever. So she's doing well. If okay. you guys don't know, D- uh, Daisy is uh, the, the AV rant official bearded dragon. She was uh, a Christmas present to my kids. And to me, but mostly to me, because my kids yep. don't really like her that much. That, that's how pets work. So, <laughs> that's how pets, why we didn't get a dog, because I didn't yep. want to take care of a dog, and I don't mind taking care of a lizard. So, uh, this is AV Rant, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. You get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. You go to www.avrant.com, and you can... Uh, leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. Mm-hmm. Where you can leave us a comment that we will almost certainly ignore. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> <about that. laughs> Don't blame YouTube. us. Blame blame the rest of the people on YouTube who are awful. Um, I have been thinking a lot about that lately, and for what wasn't there a push a while back that everybody should have to use their real names online? Oh yeah, there was Remember some that? kind of thingy legislation I, thingy that was proposed. I, I really think that that should be a thing. I, <laughs> I got to be honest with you. I, 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 this is what I think. I don't think you should have to re- use your real name. I think you should be able to use whatever username okay. you want to use. But you, whenever you sign into your computer or to any any sort of computer online internet stuff, you should have to like enter some biometric data, you know, like a <laughs> thumbprint, right? Right. So whatever, so that you, that you as a as a person no matter what username you use has like a rating mm. or a feedback section or something like that, that where so well for uber well I, i'm just saying <laughs> i don't care but uh i i i just i just feel like it, there has to be some accountability because people are awful yep. you just hear about the things that people do you know when they don't like something you say and then they threaten they say that you should die or get you know you raped or something it's just awful and then they They're downvote you for no reason. They do. YouTube on YouTube. Thumbs down. One it's a small number of people. Down. I think we can nip this all in the bud just by taking the three poop people at every movie. Poople. 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 They are poopy. About right. <laughs> they are poopy people. But we take the three people who ruin the movie experience at every single movie and we just like sequester them on an island somewhere. And they're, they're the same people. It's the same ones. You think? I think it is. I think, that, I think, I think these different. super self-absorbed completely like don't care about anyone else just care about themselves i think it's all them it's the same people same people huh Mm. they're the terrible drivers Mm. they're the people who are horrible in line at starbucks it's all the same people now okay since we're talking about that uh florida is well known for its people that can't drive mostly because they can't see mostly because they're real old and uh or they they come from other places where the driving rules are different okay. and i don't really blame people for that so much you know where there's like mores about driving like if you see a like in some places if there's a funeral everybody pulls over the side of the road mm. i would never do that i grew up in california we don't pull over for nothing <laughs> everybody keeps going if you're in the, f- the funeral's going on and then everybody you know and you're in the light you let all the funeral people go through the light you know that's that's fine but i'm not pulling over the side of the road because you people are on the funeral that's not something i'm doing i got places to go i will try not to slot into your funeral possession yes. 
But if I have to, I'm gonna. I'll even turn my lights on, you know, just for a Man. little bit to turn back off again. But today was like the day of the the, the single most aggressive driving I've ever seen. Huh. Like f- f- four or five cars in a row, different drivers, different cars, different areas were just like straight up. I was like, I'm going to watch this person die. Yeah. Any second now, they are going to crash into a median or slam somebody into something else. I've never seen, I mean, talking 20 mile an hour, 30 mile an hour difference from just trying to get three cars up. Yep. They would just stomp on it, go up three cars, slam on their brakes, and then, you know, almost drive somebody off the side of the road. It was crazy. It was a nutty day. Anyways, uh, so yeah, to, YouTube sucks. Then you can go to, uh, if you want to contact us directly, rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at, uh, at first reflect. Mine is tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore tom. You can also uh, contact our producer, Austin, who we assume is still alive. I haven't heard from him in months. <laughs> yes, he is he's, he's very... Our producer is sequestered in a shack someplace where he is completing a video, or so we hope. Uh, so Austin, uh, you can reach him at, at Austin Pond, uh, Austin, T-E-N, not T-I-N, like I thought it was. Uh, he has his own podcast, the We Watch Movies podcast, podcast about uh, mood rocks. Mm-hmm. Of course. Yeah. Mood, mood rocks and what the different rocks mean, the yes. colors and stuff. They respond to yeah. heat. Clearly that tells you you're no. Better. It's emotions. It's true. The yep. real ones. They they talk about they will talk about that fake crap that you buy at like, you know, the novelty stores. They talk about the real ones. Oh, like okay. The real ones. The ones that you come for the crystal shores. You know, the, the stores where that sell the crystals and the energy healing things. Okay. The real ones. <laughs> we watch movies. Yep. All right, uh, listeners of the week. Looks like guys, we're going to thank our uh, 58 patrons over at Patreon. They uh, have signed up for Patreon.com. Who are uh, there? That's we have 56 of them right now. Every month, Patreon takes out a amount of money that they determine. I think it's a, at least a dollar a month, twelve dollars a year. To listen to this podcast. Woo! Yep. And then uh, I mean, you can listen to it for free too. And really, I don't blame you. That's what I'd probably do. That's what most people are doing. I would appreciate. I appreciate every one of you. Every all 56 of you that that that. Oh, are it's 57 right that. now. It was 58 Ooh, when I wrote up the show notes. You keep saying 56, and it is actually 57 oh, as we record. Okay, I want to tell you. I don't know if you could, if you're watching the YouTube video, you'll notice that I'm quite a bit lighter. I have the light. I've changed the lighting, uh-huh. and I am totally going blind right now. Yeah. They're so Good job. bright. Beam of sunlight right into your eyes. Yes, patreon.com slash avrant podcast if you would like to support us financially. You can also go to avrant.com and click on the support the podcast, buy us a cup of coffee link. If you'd like to send a PayPal donation and you do not need a PayPal account, you can just use a credit card. Or you can use a PayPal account. And if you can't support us financially, which we completely understand, if you think of some other way to support us, just let us know and we will mention you on the podcast mm-hmm. so first we're going to mention heath heath talked us up to av science and svs when he purchased his jvc projector seymour elite um, seymour screens excellence acoustically transparent screen and dual sb4000 sub over av science avs av well science? they used to like that's where the avs forum came from was av science but right, since right, right. then avs forum has separated from av science av science is still a retailer avs forum oh, okay. is completely its own separate thing now but uh, yeah av science is a great retailer especially for jvc projectors so that's where we sent him I... and uh, yeah congrats heath and thanks for talking us up yeah uh ted uh we Ted's wife mm-hmm. bought him a uh, Denon X4400H for his birthday, and she let accessories for less know that it was because of us. Yeah. That's awesome. Or, you know, Thank you, Ted's wife. I'm no kidding. I'm, I'm telling you. Yeah. My wife never bought me a receiver. She I did have a girlfriend up. buy me a, a pair of uh, speakers one time, but they were Bose. At the time, I was uh, very happy. Yeah, sure. Uh, in retrospect, you yeah, know, whatever. Chris bought a uh, Murad's SR6011 from Accessories for Less and five horn-loaded in-wall speakers from HSU. He let both of them know that we recommended them, so that's great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Congrats on those purchases. Caesar told Mono Price that his speaker wire purchase was because of us, so thank you, Caesar. Yes, thank you very much, Caesar. And if you remember last week, I mentioned that my son was trying to build a, or was thinking about building a gaming uh, mm. pop, a gaming PC. Uh, 
so I had a couple of listeners contact us, uh, talk, contact me, Ron, Patrick, and McManchin Chris all wrote messages to help my son uh, build his uh, gaming PC. And Patrick even offered to give uh, me a slightly older but still very capable graphics card, which was interesting. Okay, first of all, I have had no time to look at these emails. Mm -hmm. I have looked at them. I've read them, skimmed them mostly, but I've read them, and then I have forwarded them to my son as of like, an hour ago he okay. just got them so he is now looking at them i did take out the part where patrick offered to uh give give me the graphics card because okay. i don't want him to know that gotcha because because you know i want him to still shop and, and figure yeah. out how much all this would cost patrick is sending that graphics card is on the way i got cool. the tracking information today so thank you very much patrick for that and for chris and ron uh yes it's going to be it's going to be sort of things. So some of you, they in particular, but other people too, were kind of wondering, you know, what exactly, why does it have to be a P? Okay. Yes, I know that he wants to play Overwatch. That's what he wants to play right now. Right. I don't know what he wanted to play in the future. Of course. The girl that he, he met that he wants to play games with, she uh, she only will play on PC. Gotcha. So it has to be a PC. It can't be a, a, a console game. Her brother plays on console, but she only plays on PC. So he is interested in PC. I don't think that we need to have like top of the line so that we can hook an Oculus Rift in there. First of all, I'm kind of creeped out about the whole Oculus Rift owner <laughs> people being so weird. So I'm a little off Oculus Rift right now, even though if somebody gave me the opportunity to try it, I would totally try it. Sure. But uh, uh, I don't think we're going to be going in that direction. I think what he needs is a capable gaming PC for now that if a year from now or two years from now it started chugging a little bit because it was mm. it was you know just barely doing what it could with overwatch i think that would be a good experience for him as well plus i'm using this as motivation for him to get a job he is 14 ah. years old and he can work uh he can work at, at the local supermarket they hire young kids all the time to do like stuff yeah so i am stuff, yeah uh most i think in carts and stuff like that too but yes i am very so this is this is all very good and any help that you give advice or whatever like i didn't know that graphics cards are like in short supply because yep. of bitcoin yep pretty much i had no idea crypto I mean, I had, mining. I had, that's a big i had heard about that but i had no idea that it was like a new graphics card comes out and they're all completely that's right. bought immediately yeah. and i mean how are you just not printing money if you're like nvidia or Intel or whoever they it is kind of are. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I, I mean, I would be, I would never run out. I would buy, I would make a bajillion <laughs> of them. I would just constantly. Anyways, so this graphics card offer from uh, Patrick was, ex it was like really well timed because Ron uh, offered, Ron said, hey, you know, graphics card is going to be your big expense because of this. And like 24 hours later, Patrick was like, hey, I got a graphic card. You want it? I'm like, yeah, apparently I really do. I had no idea, but I do. So that's really great. Yeah. So Ron, Patrick, Chris, thanks for helping out, Tom son that we really appreciate it uh in the news via larry our listener larry uh cinema cinemia cinema. Like it's like cinema. cinema except with an s and then it's a not a ma it's a mia so cinemia yeah. cinemia whatever is a rival service to movie pass which i can't remember what movie pass does what is it too is it's it like a the next it's sentence. like uh Okay. You sign up for a monthly subscription that lets you get movie tickets at a discount, unlike Movie Pass Cinema, which is stupid to say, sets a limit on how many tickets you can get from them a month, but that hasn't stopped Movie Pass from suing them in the USA. Since their app and service are so similar, Movie Pass isn't available in most con other countries, though. So Cinema, whatever, which is based in Turkey, is expanding. So I support this because my wife is half Turkish. They uh, recently launched in Canada, offering two tickets. Uh, or three tickets per month for ten dollars or fifteen dollars. That's pretty good, dude. I know. Three tickets for fifteen bucks. That's right. It's a very reasonable Canadian, price. but how, how in American? That's only like a dollar fifty, I think. <laughs> uh, and one of those tickets can be any sort of premium ticket, even a three D D box showing that normally costs twenty five dollars Canadian all by itself. Uh huh. They say they can. They plan to eventually turn a profit by targeting their users with ads and hopefully forming partnerships in, with theaters to help boost concession sales. Um, yeah, get them while they're hot. That's what I say because this is <laughs> well, yeah. last for a I, I don't know if I would sign up for the pay it all up front for a year because I have no idea how long they're going to be around. But on a month to month, I might give it a try. Why not try for I one month? 15 bucks for a month? I Why not? Especially Dude, in the is summer. Movie Pass is Movie Pass like a lot more expensive. Movie Pass, I think, is I I forget they've changed their prices so many times. But see, so, yeah, now that you tell me every oh Rob, I forgot to plug in my computer. What power? I'm only a, yes. 
<laughs> You're all proud for having plugged in the internet, hardwired. I plugged in everything else. All right, Which, well, you do that. I'll read the next news. No, 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 I'll, I'll keep going. I'll keep going. Once we get into the questions, once you start okay. answering something, I know, I'll, I'll go. All right, uh, Antoine, JVC, uh, yeah, Antoine, the more news. Uh, JVC is launching the LXUH1, a 4K DLP projector for 25 We just said, like, two podcasts ago that $2,500 for 4K wasn't going to happen anytime soon. Anyways, here uh, well. it is. <laughs> We'll talk about it. Yeah. It uses the 4 million pixel DLP chip that is wobbled to create 8 million pixels, same as the Optima UHD 65. Uh, they're only claiming Rec. 6709 color, 2000 lumens, and 1000... 100,000 to 1 dynamic contrast, but the differentiator is having both horizontal and vertical lens shift, although it's manual lens shift, which really, let's be honest, who cares? <laughs> yeah, well, that, well, if, if you want to do the whole two screen sizes and zoom in, zoom out, then you need the motorized lens stuff so no it, wants to do that. it doesn't have Let's that lots of people want to do that uh so i still am not super on board with this i mean it's it's very similar to what optima already has out there very similar in price as well mm. uh and it's mainly that it doesn't do so the it's white wobble color. k it's, it's wobble, wobble k then? it's wobble k yeah. although it's the you know two wobbles per frame instead of the even lower price $1,500 ones that are four wobbles per frame. Right. Uh, but it's that right. it doesn't do the wide color, you know? They're stuck at Rec. 709 here with these DLPs. Yeah. So, um, I like this, yeah, I'd, I'd still go for an Epson. I honestly would. I'd go for the Home Cinema 4000 still. 59% on my battery here. Chris ordered the inexpensive model price 9723 subwoofer. It's just so easy to say. A 12-inch sub that Brent Butterworth picked as the best budget subwoofer for the wire cutter. Sadly, the build quality seemed very poor. Two of the feet had stripped screws and the RCA jack was loose. He tried playing it and it was abnormally quiet, gave essentially no output below 35 hertz. And he got a hum as well. It's almost certainly a damaged or defective unit, but he was disappointed and unimpressed with by how cheap it felt overall. He'll be returning it in favor of a Bic F12 instead. I mean, it is a yeah. $100 sub. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I I'll be honest with you. The last time, the last time I bought a hundred dollar sub, I returned it twice before I finally figured out it just sucks, and yeah. I was stuck with it. You know, there's nothing else to do. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Again, I mean, it it pro as far as one hundred dollar subs go, it's probably one of the better ones. But uh, it is a one hundred. Clearly, sub. the one he's got is is is. Not oh yeah, that's defective. Yeah, it. that's defective. That ain't but, right. Uh, you know, the hundred dollars you got to you get what you're paid for there for sure. Bob. Bob says thanks for our speaker recommendations and the Atmos installation suggestions for his open living room slash dining room slash kitchen space. He'll be getting a new 5.1 speaker set to start and repurposing his JBL satellite speakers for Atmos as we suggested. But he wanted to let us know that we convinced him to move his big L-shaped couch about three feet off the back wall. He's enjoying the result. And you have, you, got, you know why he went three feet instead of like a foot? vacuum cleaner you can actually get it yeah, back you there. can walk behind there so yeah i didn't have new photos but i'm showing the old photos where he his old setup so he was very close to the back wall previously so yeah. now he's, he's he's closer to his tv that we thought was too small and uh farther away from that back wall uh, all good stuff two ways to fix it you buy a bigger tv or you get closer to the small one that's Those right are your options Noah. Noah wanted to suggest Mono Price's projection screens as a possible alternative to elite screens if anyone was concerned after justin's bad experiences uh what who, well remember who, who, how uh, a week or two ago justin was saying you had some bad experiences with elite screens oh right 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 so right, right. Uh, so no yeah. just so saying Noah... price sells screens too that are inexpensive you know cheaper than everyone else so maybe they're an alternative yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, they wanted to mention that Mono Price offered a multi-format frame option with manual shutters at the top and bottom to turn a 16 by 9 into a 2.35 to 1 screen. He loves his, and they're still listed on Mono Price's website, although only as open box and only in the 106-inch size right now. So either they're waiting for the next container to come from China, right. or they're never Or it's discontinued. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure which is the case. So that's Well, now that we're going to trade war or whatever, who knows what's going to happen in the yep. future here. Things are I, um, uncertain. I know... I know that you told me that every time I, I do something on my computer, it messes up my sync with my audio, but I have to open up the AC thing because in oh, 34 minutes, the AC is going to turn itself off. 54, 56% left in the battery. Yep. Joseph on Twitter, since we mentioned the Focal Birds and Little Bird speakers quite often, but we also mentioned how the birds are way bigger than you might think. He thought he might be it might be helpful to share his photo 
of their size comparison with an SVS Prime satellite speaker, which is about nine inches tall, five inches wide, and six inches deep. So I guess we're showing that right now. We are. You'll want to check out the complete two-hour version of the YouTube video if you want to see the uh, image there. But uh, yeah. So I'll be... Yeah. I'll be dead honest with you, dude. They st they look bigger in person than I, that this this picture makes me think. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm looking at this. I'm going, oh, look that big. They're bigger than that. Well, the little They're bird big. is quite reasonable. I mean, the little bird oh, is yes. visually smaller than the prime satellite, and the prime satellite is kind of the size you uh, you know nine by five by six. So right. it's, it's that compact right. size. But the bird is definitely bigger than the prime satellite. And if you were just looking at the bird in photos, you might think it's about the size of the little bird. When in fact, that's it what is I thought. Quite a bit larger. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, way better. I mean, it's like a bookshelf speaker, really. I mean, yeah. to be honest. But it's, yeah. small, it's a small bookshelf speaker, right. but it is a bookshelf speaker. When you put the stand on it, it's as tall as a bookshelf speaker. Let's get into the questions here. We're going to start with Chris. Chris has got a bunch of questions. Many, so many. we're going to try yes. to get Tuck through in. these as quickly. Yeah, we're going to be here for a bit. So, Chris, there you go. Let's say, Chris says, let's say two subs are identical in every way except for driver size. Would there really be a noticeable difference in performance or tone? Or does strictly driver size not really matter all that much? Uh, you know, it, it's very hard to say. First of all, I don't know that. I mean, first, the, the amplifier that you're using to power the speaker, mm -hmm. the driver itself, that's a different driver, which has different parameters, which is a different size. So it's a different weight and different everything. So, you know, there are going to be out of the box performance differences just in that m matching right there. Um, I don't know that I would say tonally I, you would hear differences. Yeah, that's pretty but unlikely. I, 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 there's definitely other differences that you would uh, you would experience, and probably how low they would play, how loud they could play. Uh, more likely, how loud they could play would would be the probably the biggest. Yeah, I mean, thing he's I saying identical in every way, which is a hypothetical. But right. to me, that means even though these drivers are different diameters, they have the same impedance. They have the same efficiency. Um, yeah. They have the same amount of excursion. And that is the thing that's going to change things. Because if you have two different diameters, but they both have equal excursion, then the larger one is going to displace more air. You know, it's yeah, moving back true. and forth just as much as the smaller one, but it has more surface area. So it is going right. to displace more air. Um, that said... If this is a sealed box and it's the same sealed box for both, then you have a confined sealed amount of air within that yeah. box. Uh, and if it's a ported box, then the tuning of the port is going to be equal in either case. So right. the differences would be small in this scenario, but there could be some actual difference in the amount of displacement of the air just due to greater surface area, which more or less translates into a tiny bit louder. Tiny yeah. bit. I, I mean... So we're first are such a, a unique uh, case when mm. it comes to, to home theater. We all kind of understand how speakers work. I mean, at a basic level, I think everybody sort of gets it. It moves in and out, pushes some air, makes some sound. But subwoofers, because they're you know, omnidirectional because of how low they're playing, they don't operate sort of in the mm. same, you know, they're a completely different animal. Yeah, well, this comes up quite a bit when people are asking about and, and aren't necessarily telling us all the details of their room at the same time, because it's the mentality of, I'm going to get a different product and I expect that different product to sound different. Right. Which is completely the way almost everything else works. You know, your speakers, you get different speakers, they sound different. But yeah. the subwoofer is so intrinsically coupled to the room in which it's playing that it's a different right. scenario with a subwoofer, and it's it's not you know, it, intuitive. It, I think it's interesting too because we don't often talk about this with displays, but the the fact of the matter is, is is a properly calibrated display. You know, when you're comparing displays to different displays, uh -huh. should look very similar. Very yes. You know, they should look very similar. Where you, where we are worried about the differences is well, first of all, we used to be very worried about whether or not you could even calibrate the thing to get it close. That's right. To, to, but now we don't worry about that as much because everybody sort of got that thing on lock. But now we're worried about black levels yeah. and color gamut and stuff like that. And, and color saturation. brightness for HDR. And brightness. Because yeah. mm -hmm. these are the hardware brightness. limitations that will be different from brand to brand. But when, to you, to if you were to ask us which one is going to give me the most accurate picture, we'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, like, like the most color. accurate color or something. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all sort of, they're giving you, you know, if, if you give it a 4K, it's going to put out a, 4, a 4K image and it's going to be, the lines are all going to be in the same place. I mean, there's not going to be you, <laughs> those sorts of differences. So it, it, it is sort of, uh, to me at least, the, the displays and subwoofers, that sort of performance of like, you're like, well, which one's going to sound better? Well, they're going to they're gonna sound the same, but one's going to play lower. 
if you have it properly calibrated. Or a bit louder. Right? Anyways, yeah. Yeah, or louder, right. So what are the pros and cons and differences between sealed and ported subwoofer designs? And what about cylinders? What differences do those have? I mean, this is really... I mean... I, size is it's really it's really with it it's a design choice so why would you choose one design over the other well it, it, what is the application for the sub if the application that you're designing the sub for, for is i need a sub that i can put in a small room therefore i want a small sub therefore it doesn't have to play as loud as it would if it was going to be in the bigger room which means i can make a smaller sub which means you know, I I I can maybe make a sealed one. And in a, a small box. enclosed room, you're also going to get more room gain, which is exactly. the sound bouncing back and forth across the walls and the ceiling and the floor of your room. So as you play lower and lower, you're going to get more and more reinforcement from the room itself in a small so enclosed room. Let's pretend for a second that we have two subwoofers. Uh -huh. Don't worry about price or drivers or any of that nonsense. Let's just let's just say we have two subwoofers that can that can legitimately play to 20 hertz, but okay. not much past it. One is a ported design and one is a, seal, uh, a sealed design. And you put them in a room. I mean, you stack them on top of each other. You put them in a room where they are they can give adequate out output to get to reference volume in that room. Right. So what is the difference between the sealed one and the ported one? And the answer is, to your ears, nothing. Right. They should be the same. They should sound the same. You should have the same experience. In that setup. The, in, the, that yeah, setup, in that setup, in that room. That's right. Now, why do we care about there being a ported design versus a, a sealed design? Because we're not all in the same room. Very and much somebody so. Comes, somebody comes to me and says, my theater area is eight feet wide and uh, 12 feet long. And it's got eight foot ceilings. Yeah. Is it open to anything? Oh, yes. To everything. Yeah. To the rest of the house. You're like, uh, okay. Well, somebody who, who actually has an eight foot wide, 12 foot deep, eight foot high room that's enclosed those are two different subwoofers. Very, if you yeah. want to get the if you want to get the same experience, so the differences are in where you're going to put them and how they how, how much output they're going to have and that sort of thing. Now there are subwoofers that are more accurate than other subwoofers and all of that. Yep, but so have faster transient response, but that can be due to the driver design and the amplifier design as well. So there's other variables. Could be, I mean, I, that's right, and, and and there can be a, the quick, you know, all sealed subwoofers are quicker than non than ported ones. That's just that's often, just, but not always. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, I mean, and, and all that can be designed around. And there's a reasons for using one design over the other and all of that. So when you look at somebody like SVS, they can make a subwoofer sound good regardless of whether or not it's ported or sealed. So, or play well, regardless of whether or not it's ported yeah, or sealed. Yeah, the sealed sub yeah. has a contained layer of air that doesn't escape and it acts a little bit as a spring. And yeah. all of the sound in a sealed sub is coming from only the driver. So you're getting all the sound coming from only the driver. And then as it tries to move back and forth more and more and more to play louder, it is working against that air. That That's air right. is a contained thing in behind it there, and so as it's as it's pulling into the into the subwoofer, it's compressing, having to compress right. that air, which which is hard. And then while it's expand when it's going out, it's that its air is, is creating a vacuum, which yep. expands the air in there, and it's working against that vacuum, which is also hard. Which is why you often see a big sub with ports having a smaller amp than a small sub that is sealed. Because that small sub needs that extra oomph in the amplifier yep. section to work against that air on the inside. Yep. The, the reality is, though, if you get a sub for your room that can ac a adequately pressurize your room, it doesn't matter if it's sealed or ported. It's going to sound virtually basically the same yeah as long people as the, the, like the, to over generalize and talk mm -hmm. about one is just better than the other or whatever no they have they have some different characteristics and it's all about coupling it to your room and getting right. the right design and the right size and the right price and all the things that's why it's uh it's not one size fits all not by any and when you side. when you're going from a box to a, uh, a cylinder what are yeah. the differences there I mean, it's just how you, how much internal volume do you want? How much in, how much floor space do you have? That's basically what it comes down to. The air inside or the subwoofer for the driver doesn't care if it's in a round container or a square container. It, it, it certainly doesn't make any difference. The physics of it don't change. 
I, I mean, I think cylinder subs are slightly cheaper to make, to be honest with you. Well, it's, you it's can... an efficient shape because yeah. uh, you most cylinder subs are ported. And just by virtue of it being something that you can make a small footprint, but rather tall, then you mm. can have a long port because you've made it very tall. So you have a long port and that's easy. You don't have to bend the port tube inside of a box or something like that. That's Plus right. being this round shape, it evenly feels so the pressure when the subwoofer driver is moving inside or pulling out that pressure is applied evenly to this round shape so you don't need bracing inside of a uh, cylinder it's a more yeah. efficient design and therefore you can usually make it for less money than a similar internal volume of a square box which would need bracing and probably a bit more material and more glue and all that type of stuff so it's a, right. it's more efficient but it's it's performance wise doesn't have to be any different at all he asks, since Tom and Rob both have Atmos speaker setups, what do we prefer or what do we do when the content is a 5.1 soundtrack? Do we upmix to make use of all of our speakers? Do we play it straight using only five speakers? What are the pros and cons of upmixing? Okay, so the pros, at least from my perspective, the con of upmixing is that you're relying on the algorithm that's within the, the receiver to extrapolate from the 5.1 or the 7.1 soundtrack overhead sounds. Now, by most accounts from people who have paid attention to such things, the Dolby Up Mixer does a pretty good job of mm -hmm. that. And my experience has been that I cannot be bothered to turn off the Dolby Up Mixer when it's 5.1. Okay. If I'm doing critical listening, I'm listening to, usually I'm listening to a track that utilizes all the speakers or I'm listening to a two-channel track where I will listen to it in two-channel. Okay. I am almost never listening to a 5.1 movie trying to critically listen to a 5.1 movie. You know, I'm usually critically listening to, you know, a couple of speakers or a subwoofer or, you know, it's usually just a couple of speakers. Yeah, I've got my front wide speakers, so I tend to use the DTS Neural X up mixer, uh, since the Dolby surround up mixer doesn't put anything into the front wide speakers. Um, overall, I, I do kind of, especially for say music, I uh, usually prefer the Dolby Surround up mixer if I'm going to up mix it, uh, but I want those front wides playing, so DTS Neural X it is, and maybe I'll bump down the trim level of the overhead speakers a little bit because it does tend to goose them. Um, mm. But yeah, for the most part, I, I tend to up mix things. Uh, stereo music, I mean, I don't do a ton of music listening in my theater, to be honest, so uh, yeah, some, sometimes I up mix, sometimes I don't, but uh, more often than not, I'm up mixing. My power cable is right there. All right. I mean, well, I, I, can do I, the I next almost part reach here. it. No, I'm gonna. We're gonna find a place where we, okay. it makes sense. Forty-three percent. Chris has a 1080p projector in the Atmos setup. He's noticed that more and more Blu-ray releases only have 5.1 or 7. Point, they only have 5.1. 7.1, while the 4K Blu-ray has an Atmos or DTSX soundtrack. What's the best, cheapest way for him to be able to watch the 4K discs on his 1080p setup with Atmos? audio better to use a standalone player or should he upgrade his pc so he can make uh and make mkv backups and play them via plex i mean for 200 bucks dude you can get the sony udp x 700 that i have yep and that's literally the best i mean i, I don't it's, know it's working well for easier. you <laughs> you can tell us well other, yeah other, i mean it's we I mean, Okay. The colors of Netflix. the contrast don't look all screwed up. I mean, that's the main no. Thing. It looks it looks fine. And yep. the only thing that's that's ever bothered me on it is that the the apps that are connected to it are like wonky and flaky. Okay. I mean, so we had the problem with the playing the 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 audio, right? Well, now YouTube won't load anymore. I have no yeah. idea why. I can't get it to load. <laughs> it just says YouTube constantly. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe Sony's in a battle with YouTube about something. But that I think that's the easiest way. You're just gonna get a standalone player and go with it yeah i would say get one of the sony's either the x700 or the x800 the x800 is a little bit nicer and it's older now but uh, it won't do dolby vision so if you're planning on getting a tv that's going to do dolby vision but if you're using a projector you're never going to get go dolby vision as far as we know right. so uh yeah the x800 if you can find it for cheap that would be a really good choice it lets you uh manually set how the tone mapping is done for the hdr uh, i wouldn't really recommend doing this via backups i've tried this myself now that i've backed up a few 4k uh, Ultra HD Blu-rays, played them back, back via Plex on my 1080p TV, and it doesn't do the HDR to SDR conversion properly. Uh, it's the, the contrast is all blown out, uh, and the colors are a bit wonky too. So I, I wouldn't really... Re I mean, I'm sure at some point they'll get it working, or there probably is software already of some sort that's working, but right now, uh, Plex on your PC isn't doing a great job of it. Uh, and on the NVIDIA Shield isn't doing a fantastic job of it either. So I would suggest getting one of the Sony players. 
He says the BenQ HT2550 4K DLP projector is enticing at under 1500 bucks. This is a four, this is a four, the, the four wobble wobbles one. per frame yeah. one. Yeah. Should he consider it or should he only look at more expensive 4K projectors? Also, he'd like to be able to watch uh, 3D Blu-rays. <laughs> Good luck. But so uh, so would the 3D glasses that he has for his BenQ HT2050 still work with the new projector? I don't know that any projectors are still supporting 3D. Is that? Oh, yeah. Not, yeah, the Epsons are. The they? JVCs are. Yeah. Okay, they the are. The Sony's okay. still are too. Yeah. Uh, the uh, BenQs are not something you're saying right now, so I'm starting to think the BenQs aren't the ones that. Well, yeah, these it. these 4K DLPs for the most part aren't supporting 3D anymore. Uh, too many wobbles. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> That's uh, a lot of wobbling. The the $1,500 ones, I I can't get behind them. Uh, you know, they're not doing the wide color. All the reviews are saying the HDR essentially looks no different than SDR, so it's compatible mm. with it, but you're not seeing the HDR. Um, not great black levels, a halo of light around the whole screen. I mean, they're just, it's not great. So if you if you mm. want an inexpensive one, the black levels are not fantastic on the Epson Home Cinema 4000, but they're better than these DLPs and everything else about it is better too, particularly the HDR and the wide color. Um, yeah, so that that's the sort of the least expensive one that I would recommend. That one can do 3D, but you'd need to, or, ooh, HD 4000, I'm not sure if that does. The 5040UB does, 3D, but you'd need different glasses because your BenQ HT 2050 uses DLP Link to synchronize the glasses, so that will only work with DLPs. So if you do transfer to an Epson or something, you'll you'll need new 3D glasses. He asks, where's a good place to get wall plates for speaker wire, subwoofer, and HDMI connections that have been run in wall? He wants a 7.2.4 configuration plus HDMI. He's found some three gang plates that have enough connections for 7.1 plus HDMI, but those won't quite do it. Do we have any suggestions? Mm -hmm. uh, so when I was first, uh, when I installed my first wire, you know, in wall wires at my home theater in Jacksonville, when I lived in Jacksonville, mm -hmm. I bought almost everything from uh, a company that is called like Westgate Electronics. Now, I don't know that they still sell to the public. It was like a clearinghouse. Like you could find blue jeans cables. Like they, blue jeans bought from them. Okay. Because <laughs> so, I could find like the blue jeans white jacketed Yep. Belden speaker wire. I actually mentioned to the guy, I'm like, oh, I see that you guys are selling this white jacket. Oh, that's not supposed to be up there. Hold on a second. Like, okay. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Oops. Okay. So, um, but there are, like, when, the last time I bought uh, stuff for here, I got it all off of Amazon. And it's just a matter of going through all the plates and figuring out the ones mm. that work for you. Uh, and, and, you know, just because... The, you can't get one all in one box because he wants 7.2.4 plus HDMI in one double gang box. I don't know that you're going to be able to find that, but you should yeah, be able I to find it within three. Yeah, I haven't seen that. But uh, yeah, well, Blue Jeans Cable, you just mentioned them. They do sell just blank uh, wall plates. Um, and then you just put in, you know, the, the little, you can fit like six little holes in a single yeah. gang wall plate. Yeah. And then you can put so in binding snap -in, posts or RCAs. That's the one I got was the snap in ones where you yeah. basically it's like it's like uh six or nine in there that's or whatever right. and you and you just that's what I did. And then it's they like have separate uh HDMI wall plates too. So it's not gonna be yeah. the all together in one nice three gang box thing, but if you're okay with individual single gang ones you can make whatever configuration you need. The, you can find the double gang ones of that too, the snap in yep. ones, because that's what I got. So yep. you get a double gang one and probably the HDMI by itself. And yeah. I think you that pretty much cover you. So Chris was about to purchase a 500 foot spool of bulk speaker wire from Mono Price. That's a lot of wire, dude. 165 bucks for 500 feet of 12 gauge CL2 in wall rated wire. Seemed like a nice price, but before he pulled the trigger, he checked Amazon and found a listing for NavPoint CL2 rated speaker wire, still 12 gauge, still 500 feet for only 71 bucks. Any reason to spend nearly $100 more for the Mono Price water, wire? Uh, I have not seen, and there's no link here for for me to look at it but i have not seen oh, that post it, <laughs> but uh if there the the one i would do a little just the, a modicum of research to make sure that you were actually they were actually selling what they said they were selling and, but i would totally jump on that and be honest well uh, so if it's cl2 then it should be if it is rated if it is right. ul rated it should be fine the difference is the monoprice wire is copper and the uh nave point wire is aluminum. oh is it aluminum yeah so that that accounts for the difference in price. Uh, yeah. Now, there's nothing wrong with aluminum wire. It's fine. No. It's very electrically conductive. Uh, it's a little bit more brittle. Um, usually, if you strip the wire, because it's like the copper clad aluminum where it has like a little tinning of copper on the outside. Uh, if you strip the wire and handle it with your hand, your hands will turn black. 
Uh, it's it can be very dirty stuff. So you'll want to terminate it. But there's nothing wrong with aluminum wire. It's fine. So uh, if you want to save the money, yeah, it's all right. Yeah, I have no problems with that. Chris asked how HSU uh, asked HSU how a how large a backer box should be for their horn loaded in wall speakers. They said they didn't list the numbers uh, in any of their specs, but they calculated it for him and uh, said an internal volume of roughly 585 cubic inches would be ideal. They said to make a box with approximately that internal volume and then line the inside of it with some fiberglass insulation. That sounds awfully familiar. So eight. 585 cubic inches of internal volume, what would the actual dimensions of the box he'd need to build? Well, it's one inch by one inch by 585 inches. <laughs> that would be one way to do it. That I would wouldn't do suggest it. that. <laughs> that would where the internals work. of the speaker are going to go. I didn't say that's the, that would work, though. It would. So. The math would work out. Yeah, while you're telling him this, I'm going to go plug in my computer. All right. I have 36.5% left. So normally, uh, the standard construction for your walls, and you'll want to check before you, uh, you like, don't build all the boxes and then open up your walls and discover that, oh, there's something in the way. So you'll want to check what's inside your walls first. But normally, your studs are 16 inches on center, and they're usually 2 by 4s So 2 by 4s are, in fact, 1 and a half inches wide and 3 and a half inches deep. And then 16 inches on center means that you're losing an inch and a half. So the actual width of the bay is 14 and a half inches. So you could make a box with external dimensions that are 14 and a half inches wide, three and a half inches deep, which will be the entire depth of the bay. And that would leave you then 15 and a half inches in height. That would be the size of the box. Now that would completely fill the bay within that height. It would be the entire width of the 16 inch on center two by four and the entire depth. Uh, but then it would have to be 15 and a half inches high. That leaves you in internal dimensions, assuming you're using half inch thick material, half inch thick plywood, which would be the normal thing to use here. So internally be 14 and a half by 13 and a half by three, which gets you 587 cubic inches. By three. So you're just talking about putting some, some wood on top of the bay itself and then ta capping it off at the sides, right? That's what you're talking uh, about. Oh, well, I was putting I, a back I, on it too, in case you want what, to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, yep. that's what I would do. So Bloomberg posted a video spotlighting Oswald Mill, Oswald's Mill Audio. They make record players, tube amps, and conical horn loudspeakers that cost $300,000. They do. They are neighbors of Martin Guitar Company. I don't know who Martin is. Does that make me a bad person? I mean, I... Yeah, they claimed Martin in the video guitar. that Martin Guitar are the best guitars in the world, just, just flat out. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there were people who would probably have different opinions than that uh i feel yeah. like i feel like that's not true <laughs> or maybe uh, maybe it may be subject to some discussion it could be guitar purists yes. maybe they are i mean i've never heard of them so maybe that's what makes they, them they so just good, said flat that, out that. they're the best okay anyways they source the same pennsylvania uh, hardwoods to make their speakers so whatever if you make this wood oh yes they talked about the tonality of the wood they said they you, talked about you the know the tonality of the, of the wood. slate that yes, they use they too. So, yes. you know, let's just let's just take all this with a grain of salt. Anyways, Chris the... wants our take on their video. He's never heard of this brand. Of course you haven't. You don't have $300,000 $300, to spend on speakers. And the video struck him as feeling uh, high and mighty and holier than thou. I did not get that feeling, but we'll, let's talk about this. Are they just spouting a bunch of nonsense or is there really something worthwhile to the various claims made in the video? So, so some of the claims uh, that they source their slate and it's special soft slate uh -huh. instead of hard slate. Didn't realize there was differences in slate oh, yeah. hardness, but the hard. I, I, I mean, yeah, it sounds like it could be could be a case that there is whatever softer slate, but that it would absorb resonances better, which sounds like bull to me. But let's just go on. Uh, they talked about the wood and how the wood they and they make a lot of horns out of woods, and mm -hmm. the speakers they make are very. Uh, I mean, they're beautiful. They're very. Not to my taste. To like. That's not the look I'm well, going for. But well, but come on, man. They're works of art. Let's be honest. They really are. They, they might not. You might not like the art, but you yeah. Can, oh, I got... can appreciate the craftsmanship. The yes. craftsmanship is yes. there. So, I did not take this as a as a holier than thou or high and mighty. I took it more as a. I am trying to convince you to spend three hundred thousand dollars on a speaker. <laughs> These are the reasons why. And yes. I mean, honestly, you know, they didn't come up with terrible reasons. I mean, he sh he's sitting in his, his Brooklyn studio 
this place that sells the things, right? And he's got speakers all around him that look mm-hmm. like crazy, you know, things that you would never actually buy because no one's got that much room in their house for them because they're huge too, of course, oh, they're because massive, they have big yeah. horns. Yeah. Uh, but then he's got like just oodles of recording and playback devices from all across uh, time. So everything from record players to reel to reel to things that look like he just found in the garbage someplace. But, you know, he's like, well, you know, some sources have just never been improved. That's right. You know, yes. some, some things have never gotten better. You know, we just, we, we have new things now because they're more convenient, but they're not necessarily better than what we had before. Mm. To which I say, uh, bull. <laughs> they are they are better by definition they are better because your everything you have degrades over time and my ones and yeah, zeros they, they are, are always going to be ones and ob- zeros objectively more accurate to the source yes. <laughs> but that being said uh you know it's a sales pitch so this is oh, a God, sales yeah. pitch of course and and there's nothing there's nothing wrong i mean, i really actually hear other than some of the i mean and i've heard these types of claims about so many things over the time that, that they just kind of wash over me i don't yeah. really get that same sort of indignant feeling about it. i'm like oh yes right you've yeah got i guess yeah, i've seen wood. so many of them i just ignore them now. <laughs> i mean the, the claims got oh, a right. little bit more and more ridiculous as the video went on you know by the end they're saying oh it's just it's scary listening to elvis because you know he's dead but it sounds like he's alive in your room and I'm like, well, there's a heck of a lot of variables going on into that, but okay. Yeah, let's let, let's just say, hey, Bub, if any speaker is doing its job, it should sound like Elvis is in your room. Sure, yeah. The, and you, you did not you did not invent you know imaging. By the end <laughs> of it, it sounded that... as though the the only artists you should listen to are ones who are already passed away. So that was odd. Um, but yeah, no, it, it I mean, got. I mean, it, it's Nirvana, I suppose. I don't. know. I just ignore this stuff. I I find it fluff. It's just fluff. It's marketing fluff. I mean, they may have a fantastic sounding speaker. I will never know because no one will ever play for me a $300,000 speaker because I will never be in a house that has $300,000 speakers because I I don't think I've been... I've probably been in a million dollar house before, I think. But probably not, to be honest with you. So I, uh, I, I, mean, I just... It, it, it's fine. They are selling this product and that's all that they're doing. And yes, they have to tell you that everything is, you know special or you're not gonna spend three hundred thousand dollars on it so right no, certainly don't worry about it that your speakers are not like this that's yeah that's don't worry fine. about that that's right and if you had if you're buying a guitar i guess martin they're the best so guess so lastly chris made a backup of a 3d blu-ray using the make mkv but he wants to play it in 2d will it have the same audio Will it play in 2D just fine, or is the 3D backup significantly different from backing up the actual 2D disc in any way? I don't know, but I have a feeling. It, I mean, I, I don't. The audio should be okay. Well, it'll have video, whatever. Yeah, it'll have whatever audio is on the disc, and they aren't always identical. For example, the 3D disc of Gravity. Uh, which you would want everything, but no, the 3D disc only has 5.1. The 2D disc has the Atmos track. Can't have them both on the does. same disc. Really stupid. Um, <laughs> Ran out of room. Yeah, but uh, so th- it depends on what's on the disc. Whatever's on the disc is what'll end up in your backup. And then, yeah, so what you'll end up with is an MVC file instead of an AVC file. And pretty much all of the players that'll play back MVCs will play it back in 2D just fine. Uh, I haven't really okay. come across across many that don't. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what it's doing, whether it's just taking one eye or the other. I think that's what it's doing is just taking one eye, but it's always played back just fine anytime I've tried to play one back in 2D. So uh, yeah, should, should be all right. Yeah. All right, that was the last one of him, right? We're done with yeah. him. I didn't, like I didn't accidentally hour. scroll past him. <laughs> uh, Jonathan. Jonathan says Audioholics posted a preview of the new RELT slash I series subwoofers. It reads like a press release, and Jonathan was puzzled by a couple of the statements in particular. First statement, uh, unlike most other subwoofer manufacturers, our REL strongly encourages the use of high-level connection over the use of L- the LFE input alone for a more seamless blend with the main speakers. Wouldn't that require running speakers as large, and what is our opinion on that? First of all, preview articles on Audioholics as somebody who wrote for Audioholics for eight freaking years i can tell you a preview article is a press release that has been depress released by the writer so the writer takes the press release and then goes through it maybe post i mean it depends on who it is i would take the press release read through the press release look at the product and then write an original article based on it other press release other previews can be 
a little bit of opinion at the beginning, a little bit of opinion at the end, and press release in between that. It's been almost completely unaltered, right. except to take out, which we always did. We always took out, with, because press releases are off, off, often start with, REL, the world leader in subwoofer manufacturing, right. whatever, take that line out. Then we take out any quotes of people <laughs> within the company yes, there's presidents. always like yes, yeah. the, the, there's always a paragraph and then there's a quote and then there's crap about the thing and then another quote and then a, clo a closing paragraph and then pricing usually or pictures so uh we would take out the quotes we would take out that first line and then maybe add some opinion at the front at the end or both or neither so that's what a preview article is Everywhere, but definitely at Audio Hogs is how it works. So when they make these statements, it's probably REL making these statements, mm -hmm. and that's why they are they are saying REL strongly encourages or REL says that's this. Right. They are not saying uh, the the author is not saying that Audio Hogs endorses that, but that's what REL is saying. So what is our opinion of using high level connection over the LFE input alone? Uh, I it's stupid. <laughs> I don't oh. think there's any reason for it. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think there's any reason for it. It's assuming that you don't have an adequate crossover in your receiver, I guess. Yeah, no, REL is still living in the days when uh, people were, they focus on two channel only a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so they're like, oh, stereo receivers don't have crossovers. They don't have subwoofer outputs. So this is the way you have to do it anyway. And then they're like, oh, we don't necessarily trust the Dolby Digital decoder to get it right because they, they're like, they're still talking about Dolby Digital 5.1 and a lot of their stuff like they're really stuck in the past on a ton of this stuff and they don't Welcome i mean to you would you're an audio you're an audiophile you would never use a home theater receiver to listen to two channel music i mean how could you it's not specialized for that it's nonsense yeah. yeah so think of this in one of two ways one either they're stuck in the past what rob is suggesting or what i'm going to suggest is that they're trying to differentiate themselves just like our three hundred thousand dollar speaker <laughs> manufacturer from the last one they're trying to point out why they're special why are they special because they care so much about the quality that they want you to use a different connection is it going to make any sonic difference no they're often <laughs> trying to sell to the crowd who doesn't want subwoofers at all that is one right. of REL's specialties, is marketing to two-channel only people who think subwoofers are evil, and they're like, no, 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 look, no subwoofer output, we just add this to your two-channel system, it just enhances your already fabulous full-range speakers. So that's, that's right. part of it. So another rare, this is another quote, another rare aspect of their design is the implementation of a high-level Nutric Speakton, or Speakon input speaking terminated cables are greatly preferred for their reliability and security over uh, standard banana plugs or bare wire uh, followed by later this is a, another quote if you've got a space and you really want to locate one of these subs but don't have a pre-wire run for it don't sweat it you can add their compact aero wireless kit to, to any uh, rel ti subwoofer for free from the confines of a cave uh to be free from the confines of a cable at no penalty in audio performance so which is it are speak con connectors better or are they are confined and if the wireless connection offers no penalty in audio performance are they saying it's better than bare wire so supposedly these connections the speak con connections is better than bare whatever um yeah they're just trying to sell you the the, the wireless kit to begin with there sure. but again 200 uh, bucks for a wireless subwoofer kit. 200 bucks for a si wireless subwoofer kit and the the again I, I really feel like this is just another way of them saying oh well you know other well, other manufacturers will tell you they use banana plugs but those aren't good enough for us we gotta have these special ones which by the way we sell and they cost a lot more uh I, it's not it's nothing just no. it's just i mean speak nothing. on terminals you'll very often find on like professional monitors like professional uh what do DJ they look like i don't know what these things look like what they're they? they're just like, like uh, look, look i mean pin? they're very similar to an xlr connection but they've got like that round inner piece of plastic um so oh, it's, it's yeah, a round about, connection yeah, yeah. with like the little round inner thing there and it's just a speaker wire connection but yeah you'll very often see them on like pa speakers and that right right um so i mean it's a I don't know. I mean, it's no better than bare wire. It's not better. It's a different. Type none of, of this is. None of this is. This is. I mean, if the electrical connection is going through yeah. and there's not like added impedance or resistance or something like that, which there shouldn't be with almost every one of these things, it's convenience. Yeah. All well, we're I mean, talking about here is convenience. are nice in that they kind of click in. They kind of lock. So that's that's, that's nice. A, a nicety. Banana like plugs use work a too. Locking banana plug, yeah, that'll work just as well. No, uh, so yeah, it is. It's marketing fluff. It's definitely press release stuff. It's not Autoholics saying it. They're quoting what REL is sending them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. This comes from Nick in Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne, Melbourne. 
Nick made a few upgrades to his theater. He purchased an X3300W, added a pair of Atmos speakers, and rebuilt his Dynalio speakers himself to get them new enclosures. Well, he's a handy man, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Now he wants to focus on his subwoofers. His room is small, roughly uh, 1180 cubic feet, and it is enclosed rectangle with a sliding door. He has one Sunfire True, so the dual 10-inch drivers with 2700 watts peak and 11-inch sealed cube response to the 22 hertz. Uh, and he's happy with it, so we'd like to continue using it. Okay, uh, first of all, remember what we said before about subwoofers being small? And if you want them to be small, they got to deal with that mm -hmm. you know, the air inside, so they need a big amp. 2,700 watts. That's right. <laughs> That's a lot of watts for an amplifier, <laughs> uh, for a little subwoofer. But the Sunfire doesn't sell that model anymore. If you want, were to get another Sunfire sub, you'd only be considering their least expensive Dynamic Series due to budget. The largest Dynamic Series model, the 12-inch, uh, only claims response down to 28 hertz. So should you consider an SVS sub instead? And if so, should you get an SB1000, 2000, or maybe a ported model? Uh, I think he wants probably sealed, I would guess. Yeah. He would st want to stick with sealed. Um, oh, yeah. 1180 down to 22 hertz mm -hmm. sb i mean I, you could def I, I think you get away with the sb 1000 but i have a feeling this man's going to want to go for the sb 2000 to be honest with you. i mean uh, what i would do is check with the svs dealers in australia and see if any of them still have an sb 12 nsd the model well, that the 2000 I, I, like, replaced you, you disappeared for a bit so you're gonna i missed everything you said so just assume just go on Okay, so yeah, because the SB12 NSD, which is replaced by the SB2000 in the lineup, um, that's almost like the perfect choice. It's got like almost the exact same extension as your current sub. It should be a little bit cheaper because the SB2000 has replaced it now, so the SB12 NSDs were on clearance. Uh, but it's a little bit more output than the SB1000 would give you. So yeah. uh, I would. But I think you could probably. I, I didn't hear what you said, but I, I I initially said that I thought he could get away with one thousand. Did you? Yeah. Agree with that? Yeah. Ah, it's a little bit iffy. I I, I kind of would hem and haw about it. I mean, I would agree if you just gave me this room size, it'd be like an SP one thousand to be fine. Yeah. But it doesn't quite extend down to twenty hertz. That's like the only model SVS makes that doesn't quite extend down to twenty hertz. This one doesn't. The so far doesn't. This one doesn't either. Yeah. I mean, the SP one thousand would probably be quite close in this room size. It would yeah. probably be fine. I, I, I do think that, that he's going to end up with a 2000 no matter what yeah. we say. <laughs> so the, the 2000, <laughs> the no, so good no worries about the 2000. If you get the 2000, yeah, yeah. no worries. But I would definitely check around and see if anybody has an SB12 NSD for a lower price because that would be ideal. So his current sub is in the, the rear left corner beside his back row of seats that are right up against the back wall. He's thinking he'll put the second sub in the front right corner. Any comment on that plan? Rear left corner, front right corner. Yep. In an good. enclosed rectangle. Sounds perfect. Perfect. That's our comment. Enjoy. Yes. Heath. Heath's theater uh, build began almost two years ago with a completely unfinished basement and writing us to figure out which section ought to be made into a dedicated rectangular theater room. We dealt with the water softener tank and piping for a sprinkler system uh, with a suggestion for a false wall. This is the guy who flooded, right? He flooded? No, no, yeah. that was somebody else, but... Uh, oh, whatever. Yeah, okay. this was... Along, I get, if you're watching the YouTube video, there's going to be all sorts of pictures, so you're going to yep. want to check that out. Along. along the way, we discussed pretty much every aspect of Heath's build, seating and placement, speaker choices, subwoofer choices, screen and projector choices, wiring, finishing, all of it. His theater is nearly complete now. He wound up with uh, a Perian Varus series speakers. Oh, uh, finally! <laughs> I finally get one win in the in the column. <laughs> in that sense that, uh, everybody's buy your stupid speaker. No, buy my speakers. I, I, I assume that you demo that you demoed them and you loved them and good on you i, I, I don't i have no horse in this race other than just because rob always wins uh he's got dual svs sb 4000 subs a morantz sr7010 and two rows of recliners that he wanted neutral gray and back for the room uh neutral gray and black for the room and now that he's ordered his clearance jvc rs520 projector and 92 inch acoustically transparent seymour screen he'll just he's just waiting on those to arrive before he mounts the screen on his false wall fills in the rest of the false wall with black panels and gets the projector fired up and then you're seeing these pictures this place looks awesome so i mean before and after this is like a complete transformation of completely bare basement everything open so now he doesn't have the screen in yet but that's kind of cool because we can still see where the water softener and that is and then yeah, yeah, the rest of the room is looking pretty. You know darn what spiffy. I want? 
do we know what i know he gave us a budget at one point to know this thing i wonder how much he actually spent yeah i would like to know that because this, this some people would like to know that answer to that question absolutely you could go from this to this mm. and this is how much he spent doing it. does That's that right. mean you're gonna spend that much i don't know i don't know how much he did it himself but this thing looks awesome yes so just a comment first that we talked about making sure he could protect his projector by plugging it into an APC for battery backup. The in-wall kits from brands like Sandus seem kind of expensive, and his electrician said that it was against code to just run Romex between the projector and the UPS directly. So he found an inexpensive male electrical plug on Amazon that fits into a normal single gang electrical box, so that got installed beside, behind his PC, his APC, sorry. Uh, and a regular extension cord goes from the APC to that male inlet, then Romex goes from the male inlet to a regular female inlet, and is ceiling outlet in this on the ceiling and his projector can plug into that ceiling outlet directly much less expensive than the electrical in wall kits it is an electrical in wall kit you just made it yeah you, <laughs> you put it together yourself you, one you piece just, at a time that's right yeah and that's exactly what i did and i'm sure at what some point that's exactly what i told you to do i did the same thing with my parents my parents were like right. I, would, I tried to explain to them what it was and they just got this glassy look over their eyes and they ended up buying a kit Sure. Which was like a hundred bucks or something like that, right, one hundred ten dollars. Yeah, $110. yeah see, his was like thirty dollars all in. So yeah, 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 right. and that's what the thing is. It, it, the problem is, is finding that male outlet or inlet mm. or whatever we call that thing, so that you could run it. But everything else is fine. And your your, your electrician was absolutely right. This is against mm -hmm. code to just run Romex directly to it. Oh so yeah, you don't good. just have Romex poking out of your wall through a hole. That's that's yeah, not how that. They done. frown on that. <laughs> so anyways, he'll have his JVC RS five twenty projector mounted to his ceiling with his chief projector ceiling mount that offers a lot of adjustments for pitch, roll, yaw, blah blah blah. JVC also offers both horizontal and vertical lens shift. So what's the best way to get the image perfectly aligned on the screen? Should you try not to touch the lens shift? and just adjust the chief mount as much as possible, would that result in keystoning? Now, the, the lead shift is perfectly fine, dude. That doesn't it, it, it just, I mean, basically, in this room, all you want your projector to be is facing dead forward. I'm sure he's got it mounted smack dab in the middle of the room. Why wouldn't he? I mean, it's his, yeah. his dedicated <laughs> home theater. Smack, yeah, face, face forward and level, and then anything else you need to adjust, you know, you just... You adjust that with the with the lens shift. The lens shift does not add to keystoning or your ability. But you're the, not the being mount able to could right. So right, if you angle it wrong, right. Yeah. So what you're going to want to do is 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 you're going to use both because you're going to mount it up there and then you're going to turn the projector on and pretty much all projectors have an internal grid pattern that you can throw right. up. So you project the internal grid pattern and it's not going to be aligned on your screen at this point, but no. leave it where it is. And at this moment, you use just the adjustments of your chief projector mount to perfectly square up the image. You want all of the lines to be perfectly level, the horizontal lines perfectly level, the vertical lines perfectly vertical, everything perfect and square. And then you use the horizontal and vertical lens shift to get it to align with the borders of your screen. That's right. what the two different functions are. So you don't want to, so let's say when you first mount the projector and you turn it on, it's, the image is projecting too high, right? Part of the bottom of your screen is blank and part of the image of the uh, projected image is above the top of your screen. You don't want to just tilt it down with the chief mount. That no, will no. create keystoning. So you're just using the chief mount to get a perfectly square and leveled image and then you use the uh, lens shift to align it to your screen. Lastly, he says he does have a plans to add acoustic treatments, but he's out of money at the moment, and he's already it's already sounding pretty good to him. The front left speaker is somewhat compromised by having to be positioned between his water tank softener and his sprinkler tank, but that is what it is. So are there any final suggestions we have for his room? He's already resolved not to look any more equipment reviews for the next year. That's a good idea. <laughs> Let me look back at this thing, at the specifically at the front of the room here. Because yeah. I thought when I saw these pictures earlier that I didn't really see a problem with this placement. You could uh, cheat that speaker just a little bit more forward, maybe. Like, just get it to as forward as you can. But I it's going to be yeah, right up the, on that speaker grill. Yeah, I think the that, base of the uh, speaker stand that he's using is kind of already <laughs> up against the... Yeah, I can see that, but... I, I'm there. just wondering how far you know. It, it just, just, just get as far forward as you can. Everything looks fantastic. I don't. It really, really does. I don't uh, really see a problem. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what he went for with control. It looks like he's got a little thing where he can mount an iPad into one of his cup holders. So he's probably yeah using something along those lines. Um, but no, I mean everything in here looks pretty darn fantastic. I like the cross 
diagonal corner placement for the two subwoofers. So that's that's very nice. Everything's nicely tucked in in a Santa stand mm -hmm. that has casters that he can pull out. Um, so the only thing in his email, he mentioned that he had already run Odyssey uh, as things are right now because he was mm -hmm. doing his setup. Be sure that once you have the setup completely finalized, you do that again because yeah. there will be some minor little changes that happen with having put in your screen and that. And when you do add your acoustic treatments that you've already planned on, you'll want to run Odyssey yet again, because that will once again change the acoustics. Uh, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, things are looking spiffy. Adriano. Yet another friend of Adriano's in Australia is looking for some suggestions. You should suggest they start listening to this podcast. <laughs> and then they don't have to bug you. His friend is putting together his first dedicated theater. Adriano has already tried to discuss some of the, shall we say, compromises that are being implemented. But his friend seems set on the decisions that have been made. So these are the decisions. The room is a 21-foot square. It so is. There's no, there is no changing of the dimensions, and it has a slightly lowered 7-foot, 2-inch ceiling. The sofa will be 7 feet from the back wall, 14 feet from the front wall. The speaker configuration will be 7.1.2. And yes, Adriano has already tried to get him to consider 7.2.4 or 5.2.4, but that's a no-go. Furthermore, the surround back, surround, and top middle speakers are all going to be in-ceiling speakers, and those are already pre-wired. Nothing in my brain can imagine what top, middle, and surround in speaker in ceiling speakers look like yeah it's gonna they be a look bit like weird. The, they're right on top of each other like within <laughs> inches of each other like the surrounds might be slightly further back or something yes and maybe uh, slightly farther slightly apart. wider yeah i guess yeah is what yeah i mean they seem like they'd be right next to each other so i, I like i've been trying to wrap my brain around that part of this whole I know. thing i mean if it were top front else? and top rears and then in ceiling surrounds and in ceiling surround backs i might say the some things are probably going to sound redundant but it would function uh, but yeah, surrounds and top middles, that's they're going to be close to each other. Are going to be playing, they're going to be awfully close to each other. It makes zero sense but in my we're mind not here to that, debate that. So, I'm, hey, okay. I'm just pointing out, I'm just, I'm just reinforcing what Chris is probably thinking and said multiple times to his friend. But Adrian. what ifs? Hey, whatever, him yes. too. <laughs> Furthermore, okay, whatever said that. With all that sell, the request is for nine speakers, six of them in, uh, being in ceiling, and one subwoofer for $3,500 to $4,000 Australian. Mm. Despite not going with any of Adriano's other advice, for some reason this friend is fine with going with whatever speakers we recommend. <laughs> they got to be in wall. So nine, six of them are being in ceiling, in ceiling, and so that just the front three. The front three be... are regular, and then a subwoofer, and only one. 21 Australia, by 21 by 7. I, I, thought, I, I think you can get SVS in Australia. You can get so. SVS, yeah. And a 2000 series would be fine for this room size. That, yeah, about yeah, 3,000 yeah. cubic feet. Uh, but they're like, so in Australian dollars, it's like twice the, val the numerical right. number of the US price. So you're looking at around $1,500 for a 2000 series, a ported one. Right, that, that leaves you like 2000 to 2500 bucks left for the rest of the speakers. Yeah. And I don't really know what speakers there are there. I mean, I know what I saw when I was there, but uh, he's already dead. He's already dead set on in ceiling speakers, so yeah, that's really where but I. But it's run a little into bit lowered is. ceiling, so uh, you could maybe get away with five and a quarter inch ones instead of six to save some money. Instead of six and a half yeah. inch drivers, you go with five and a quarter inch drivers because that'd be fine with the lowered ceiling. I mean, they, but I don't they, know what manufacturers are available over there other than like Dolly, I know is there. Yeah. And, you know, well, the uh, two ones that I found like that. at a few Australian websites that I peruse that I would wholeheartedly endorse would be CAF and right. Yamo. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot about Yamo. Yeah. Yeah, Kef, Kef and Yamo would both be really good choices. They're definitely available in Australia. I found them at several Australian different websites. Now, the Kefs, again, you know, the, the prices are like twice what they are in the U.S. So it right. might be difficult if you're going for the newest Kef Q series because um, like the the big center that they sell alone is like a thousand Australian dollars. So that's eating up too much of your budget. But if they still have some stock of the older Q series, um, right. which a lot of stores still do, um, that would probably work, and they definitely make some nice five and a quarter inch diameter in ceiling speakers that would work just fine. You'd go for the CS series uh, if you're going with Kef, and then Yamo uh, was did have some offerings that are a little bit less expensive. So I'd look at those two. That's my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. 
I mean, let's be honest, dude. This guy, this, your friend here, and and I, I believe me when I when we talk about stuff like this where we disagree or we don't agree with what p- people have done or whatever, we've all been in this situation. And the reality is, is he's gonna or she, I don't really know, is going to enjoy their setup mm-hmm. regardless. It's going to be something better than anything they've heard in their house before. Mm-hmm. And even though those speakers are going to be redundant, they're still going to be uh, or co-located. They're still going to be different than anything they've 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 experienced. So they're they're going to be really pleased with it. Um, so don't sweat it too much. <laughs> that, <laughs> which speaker choices that they get, because any I, I, I got to believe they're going from, uh, you know, TV speakers or yeah, something, right. you know, anything is going to be an upgrade. So just find something that works within the budget that won't be too, you know, crazy uh, cheap as far as quality wise and, and sound quality wise. And I think you're gonna be okay. Calf, Yamo. Uh, I'm trying to think of other manufacturers that are out there that I remember. But I, Dolly, of course, but I think Dolly probably be end up being way too expensive. Yeah. Um, and the SVS again, speakers are, are way overpriced. Like the prime center is a thousand Australian dollars, which is insane. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, <sighs> all right. It's tough Brock. prices. Brock just bought an Oppo UDP203 Ultra HD Blu-ray player a couple of weeks ago. Then, of course, last week they announced that they're going out of business. They're not actually going out of business. They're just not going to sell well, stuff here anymore. Yeah. He knows that they've said they'll continue to su- provide support and firmware updates, but do we think he should maybe return it? It's great so far, but he's worried about the long term. I, I, you know, this is a very hard question for it us is. to answer because uh, we have no idea. My, I'll tell you what I would do. What I would do is I would keep it. I would keep it because most of the problems that they've had with that thing, they've already had. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you know, the kind of things that they have to issue firmware updates for, like specific, you know, the early releases of Blu-rays, I mean, you know, Ultra HD Blu-rays that were weird and they had to be, they had to uh, do a specific firmware for that specific movie. A lot of that stuff's been ironed out. Mm-hmm. And the, going forward, you're not going to end up, have a lot of those problems. Um, it's a very good player. Yeah, it's it's it, it's it's easily one of the best on the markets uh, on the market right now. And I would be uh, it, any movie that didn't play on this thing or any issue you might have with it. I think you know it's going to be probably worth it for everything else that it gives you. In my mind, in my mind, I'm also thinking that you know. Most of the other Ultra HD Blu-ray players that I've experienced, or, or especially the one I'm experiencing right now, doesn't fill me with a lot of confidence that you're going to find <laughs> a better one right. out there that's going to give you an experience that's going to be as good. At least up until this point, Oppo has been extremely responsive about their players and supportive of their players. So yeah. if it were me, I would keep it. I w- yeah. If you said, I'm, I'm not comfortable with it, I'm, t- I'm, I'm sending it back. I, I would say I would yeah, understand that, that too. too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I I wouldn't return it. Uh, I'd keep it, and I don't think you'll have much trouble selling it in the future. Um, that there are going to be Oppo fans for a long time to come, and so yeah. It's a very good point, and something that should be maybe mentioned as well is that you may find twenty years from now that Oppo players are going to be you know worth tens of a thousands collector's of dollars. Item, yeah. yeah, for, you know, the audiophile crowd who yep. doesn't believe that crystal-based music is, you know, <laughs> is as is as pure as the the the, the golden age of music that was Blu-ray or Ultra HD Blu-ray. So, I just you just you know, I I'm not I, I would not be surprised if we'll find somebody putting you know, drilling a little hole in one, adding a tube to it, and having it in an audio file system 10 years from now. I would not be surprised. Secondly, he says, we discussed his future theater room options where right now he's using an in-law suite, but he has an unfinished basement that is basically split in two sides by the staircase. We decided, he decided that he will go for the dedicated theater in his basement. All right, that's good. Yep. One of the things we mentioned uh, might be a good idea in this basement would be a drop would be a drop tile ceiling. We said that he'd want to use proper acoustic ceiling tiles, not just the thin, cheap, normal ceiling tiles. But when he started to do some research, he found that there are a ton of ceiling tiles that claim to be acoustic. Mm-hmm. That's in air quotes for those of you that aren't watching the video, and many of them give NRC ratings, but they all seem to just be fiberglass. So will those really block any sound from getting upstairs? Is there a particular brand or type? of tile that we can point to as an example. 
I'm sure Rob has an example. Yes. So first of all, the NRC ratings are talking about um, the, the, that's the same thing that you would find on an absorption panel. Yeah. So that is not sound proofing. That is not sound blocking. That is absorption. Of, yeah. uh, of reflection. So you you put a sound on one side, and then you put the uh, uh you put the, the panel, the acoustic tile there, or the panel, whatever the case may be, and you put a microphone on the other side. You play it at a certain volume, and on the other side, you record it, and you're like, okay, what was the volume difference? And that tells you that's what that. that uh, that's well, what not quite. That would be the STC rating, which is the oh, thing you're actually looking yeah. for. Yes, yeah, so the yeah. STC rating is the sound transmission coefficient. That's what you're actually looking for, and most tiles don't have one because they're not soundproofing tiles. So right. that's one clue. If you find tiles that have an STC rating, that's what you're looking for when it comes to soundproofing. And what you're looking for is a tile that has a solid backing of some kind. Usually vinyl. Sometimes it's a uh, metal um, that they have on there, but it's a solid backing that you're looking for. Um, there's a company called Acoustical Solutions. You can look at their barrier acoustic tiles. You don't have to get theirs, but that's an example of the type of thing you're looking for and those have an STC rating to tell you how much sound they actually block from 26 getting up they, they, they block 26 dB yeah. I guess is what 26 is right dB uh, STC doesn't exactly translate to dB because it's different at different frequencies but mm. uh, yeah it's there you go Josh Josh would like our comments on ratings <sighs> they say ratings they just left out the A for it's ratings uh, long-term OLED burn-in test. They are running six LG C7 OLED TVs for 20 hours per day, five hours on, one hour off, all controlled automatically. Five of the TVs are set to 200 nits for SDR, 100% white. And one is set to four th uh, 400 nits, the maximum OLED light setting. Two of the TVs, one of them being maxed out, the maxed out set, are showing nothing but CNN. One is showing nothing but pre-recorded football games, and one is just turned to the to NBC all the time. The two are showing video games, one with a static uh, HUD or HUD, and Hands one display. without. That's right. So if they, they should face all these TVs at each other. <laughs> <laughs> nope, they're all on a wall. It would be fantastic if they were all facing each other. So the CNN ones and the NBC ones and the... <laughs> The Call of Duty ones were all fighting. All right, they're taking photos of test patterns in full uh, in full screen colors every two weeks. So far, the worst image retention has been the 200 nit CNN TV, not the maxed out CNN TV. Routings themselves are saying that the results are not intuitive and not what was expected. But what do we have to say about it? I don't know, dude. That's so why the two hundred the two hundred nits versus the four hundred nits? I have a feeling it has something to do with all the the, the four hundred nits. Everything getting washed out evenly, <laughs> so you're <laughs> you're rather than the two hundred nits where some things are are actually able to have some variance, and therefore you're you're seeing it. But that would be my guess. On on that front, I think it's the automatic brightness limiter. Yeah, because be. when oh you... you're right too that's right the 400 nits the automatic brightness after you leave it on for what like a, a minute or two or something like that it, it cuts it yeah it's like a couple minutes yeah after after it's been bright like that for a couple minutes it reduces the light output down to 130 nits so oh, so maxing go. out the the light output uh can actually result in a dimmer image than setting the oled light setting lower um i mean being that it's cnn it's unlikely they're showing you like a full white a lot of the time right but you're still going to activate the automatic brightness limiter. So that that is why I suspect the one with the maxed out OLED light setting is probably actually dimmer <laughs> a lot of the time. Right. Um, right. So I have a big, big problem with this test, which is that they don't have a control. They don't have right, a single properly calibrated display. That is true. Right. Five of them are 200 nits, which is twice as bright as it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be 100 nits, right? Aren't you it's supposed, supposed to, to be 100, like 100 nits? Yeah. 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 Which you is should have one that's at, that's at, that one's one the control one that you're talking about. Yeah. It's that's that's calibrated properly, doing everything it's supposed to do properly. They should have one for each one of the video settings. They really. actually should. Yes. Yeah, Although that's a lot of TVs to buy. Hey, they they can't afford an A. I'm surprised they can they can afford yeah. any of these TVs. But I have, a, I have a big, big problem with not having one properly calibrated display in this. Now, they, they're saying their 200-nit CNN one, they're treating as their control. I'm like, how is that a control? That is completely a, a test criteria. 
you've miscalibrated yeah. it and used it in a way that very how many people are going to leave it on for five hours on cnn turn it off for an hour and then turn it back on to cnn for another five hours every single day 20 hours a day and by the way the pixel refresher that can run automatically takes slightly more than one hour to run which means they're interrupting the pixel refresher hmm on purpose. Now they said they're running the pixel refresher manually before they t they run their test patterns and take their photos. But I'm like, but this thing is supposed to run like every couple hundred hours, like right. automatically. And you're doing it every two weeks, 20 hours a day. So they're not really allowing the TV to even function the way it's designed to. And it's miscalibrated. Now, I will say the flip side of this is if you just go into the picture modes right the different picture modes yeah. and you choose any of the default ones that are not the isf dark room mode almost all of them have the oled light setting set at 50 or 60 some are 70 or 80 the vivid of course is all the way up at 100 now how can i blame a user for going in and choosing the standard picture mode or the sports picture mode like it's right there Right. I can't I really can't blame someone who goes in buys an OLED and chooses that picture mode. It's it's there for them to choose. So it's fair enough to say we're going to set the OLED light setting and the contrast and brightness and whatever at a level that is above what a properly calibrated TV should be because the default picture modes are there. That's a fair test criteria, but there really should be one that's properly calibrated to 100 nits. So it still doesn't tell us if a properly calibrated OLED is going to get any image retention. And right, right. why is the 200 nit CNN burning in? Well, because you've got the CNN logo that never goes away. And the 200 nit right. setting is not activating the, I mean, it is activating the automatic brightness limiter, but not as much as the 400 nit one. Yeah, and I mean, it's not just that CNN logo either. It's that entire background. The ticker at the, the bottom, little, that's right. The ticker at the bottom, that's the thing that's going to get you. And then yep. there's a lot of other stuff that they that are is on the screen a whole bunch when you're seeing, you know, the talking heads and stuff like yep. that that are there. So, yeah. But look, if, if this is the way you use your TV, yeah, yeah, get an LCD instead. Yeah, that's what you do. But I mean, all the other TVs, I mean, even the ones that's showing like the nothing but a football game with a heads up display, they're like, yeah, there's a teeny tiny little bit of image retention, but it pretty much goes away after we run the pixel refresher. So I'm like, okay. So, so even when we abuse these for the most part, they're okay? Abuse, Good. For the most part. Wow. You that's can, how I interpret this. You can burn it in. Yeah. Just like you could with a plasma. It was possible. I'm not going to say it's not possible. Absolutely. It is possible. I just love it when they do tests like this. It's like, it's like a... You know, taking a uh, drive, you know, going for a car test and you're driving it directly into a wall and say, see, yeah. it can crash. Yeah, it can crash. If but you crash the, it. The people on YouTube are <laughs> freaking out. OLED is the devil now. So good on know. you. Thanks. Thanks, YouTube. This is why we, this is why we can't have nice things. Ted. Uh, we missed his Ted. second question, Josh's. Oh, did we? Yep. Josh is still rocking a... Pun I keep... I scrolled after a while. Uh, still rocking a Panasonic Plasma. Not a hint of burn-in on it, by the way. Mm. And it's probably because you don't set it to 200 <laughs> nits and then watch CNN for five hours and then turn it off for an hour and put it back on for CNN five hours. I want to say when you said who would do it like that, I was thinking, yeah, my in-laws used to watch like CNN okay. all Well, then day they should long. get and an was, LCD. There you go. They had a plasma. And guess what? That plasma is currently at my brother-in-law's place. And it doesn't have burn in because yeah. I set I I I said it I said it did the settings on it. <laughs> and I made sure they didn't have it on vivid mode. Yes. Josh is still rocking a Panasonic plasma on a hint of burn in. He loves it's a deep black level. So OLED is definitely on its radar. But if you if he were to consider a new TV, he'd want it to be larger than seventy inches. So what are the chances of a reasonably priced larger than seventy inch OLED? What's reasonable to you? Right. <laughs> let's, so let's start with that. Do you have $20,000 lying around? Because right. you could probably get one right now or very soon. Well, but that was if, just it. So yeah. the, you had the G6 77 incher. That was $20,000. Yeah. Yeah. Then the following yeah. year, you had the G7 and the W7 77 inchers, and those were $15,000. So it came down. Getting there, dude. And then now this year, we have the 77 inch C8. And it's available for $9,000. So the price is definitely coming down. And 77 inches seems to be the size that they have. That's above 70. Uh, $9,000 right. still a heck of a lot of money. Uh, but way better than 20000 two years ago. <laughs> so I don't know how much more it's going to come down. They have 
they they're they're constructing that gigantic manufacturing plant for more right. OLED big panels. So um, I yeah. I mean, if if it got down to five grand, I would jump on it. You know that that might be two years away, but yep. if it got down that low, I would probably jump on it. But uh, it's moving in the right direction, at least. It's moving in the right direction, yes, yeah. exactly. On to Ted. Ted says we've talked about reference volume, and Odyssey has a reference curve for the frequency response. And if you go the clips, they have reference everything. <laughs> but is there such a thing as a reference waterfall graph? Would that potentially be more useful than a reference frequency response curve? A uh, frequency response curve, you can look at it <laughs> and understand what you're looking at. <laughs> a waterfall plot is like nearly impossible for the layperson and some professionals and or quasi professionals, <laughs> if that's what you consider me to be, to look at it and just go, oh yeah, that looks like a pretty good one. No, I mean, should there be one? Is there one? I don't know if there is, but if there is, it certainly isn't something that I think is going to be helpful for the for most people. <laughs> so, I mean, a waterfall graph includes the frequency response that that the, up, the uppermost part so uh, i'm showing an image of an example of a waterfall graph but to describe right. it for people who are it. only listening in the audio um it kind of I looks like it. mountains all right uh, and so the very top the the tops of the mountains is your frequency response and then it looks as though the graph is coming like towards you out of the screen in a 3d fashion and that's showing the decay times so if you look at each frequency from low to high, low on the left, high on the right, uh, you can see the frequency response at the top, and then you can see the decay times of each of those frequencies as the sort of mountains coming towards you look. So what would a reference waterfall graph look like? Well, we've described it a few times, which is that what you want to see are relatively short decay times. You don't want any super long decay times. You don't want the mountains to really come very far toward you. And we would expect in any room that the lower frequencies will naturally have slightly longer decay times than the higher frequencies, just because it takes that much more time for them to form in the first place and then dissipate. So a reference waterfall graph would have a gradual uh, so the mountains would gradually come closer toward you as you go lower in frequency. And the top of it should be pretty close to a flat line or maybe a slightly rising line toward the low frequencies. So in both okay. cases, your reference frequency response is a gradual, smooth, maybe slight rise towards the base. And so would the decay times. They would be a slight increase in decay times. So it looked like a wedge if it, if it was yeah, optim kind of a wedge. optimized, yeah. kind of a wedge. So for those of you that, that uh, Rob described it pretty well, but I, I just want to, sometimes it helps to hear it twice. Mm -hmm. If you took a normal frequency response graph, which is a line, yeah, right? You took that line and then when you hit the note, Right as the as over time and time would be coming towards you on the z axis. Right. Right. As time goes on, the volume that that note uh, uh, for each frequency, the volume is being plotted across time. So it's getting lower and lower as it comes towards you. That's, That's right. the mountain he's talking about. He's talking about the out the con the contour of that. And that's essentially what's happening. They're just plotting the volume difference you know the mm -hmm. as uh, over time and that should be a fairly steep mountain at the front and at the very at the, and the, at the top and the higher frequencies the lower frequencies it's going to be a little bit sh not as steep yeah okay. yes. i don't know if you can't picture that then go to youtube.com slash yeah. <laughs> rant and uh check out the video the show notes will have the question time stamp apparently it's a thing we're doing now oh yeah uh, Bob. Bob has a set of Snell speakers that are probably about 20 years old now. He's used these speakers in three different rooms, and he's always had some dialogue intelligibility issues, so it might have been that the room or his positioning every time, but he thinks there's a pretty good chance that the speakers themselves could simply be better. He knows our advice would be to listen to as many different speakers as possible, even models that are way out of his budget, but he simply doesn't have the time or the inclination to go through all of that. He, so he wants to put us on the spot with a $1,500 budget for three speakers up front LCR. What's our number one go-to pick? He always sits a, a normal 12 to 15 feet away, so no long list of options. What's the number one choice? <laughs> um, Mine might surprise you. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be honest with you, dude. Uh, I, I, I would... I, I think it's probably not your speakers. <laughs> That's that, it, without me having any more information than what you just told us here. My guess is that you, there's you're having some because Snell speakers 
in general. Now, they're 20 years old, so I don't know which ones you have or anything like that or who made them or anything like that. But they're, they were never a budget option. No. <laughs> that, for they're people. good speakers. So, I would I would believe that the speakers themselves would probably be okay. I would bet the room is doing something. Maybe you're sitting against a wall, or you've always sat. Yeah, against have you the always wall. Had sat with your seat up against the back wall? Maybe a lot of people do. My my guess would be maybe that or the 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 speaker placement as far as where you're putting. The yeah, have you like maybe always a... recessed your center speaker and pushed it back on its like TV? That stand being or said, something? let's hear what Rob has to say because I'm very curious what you okay. have to say. What, no, what if, if say? I had to do one pick that I think will work for a lot of people and sound really good for a 1500 budget for front, uh, left, center, right, I would get the Varus Grand. Speakers from Aperion. Look at you go, stealing my choice. Uh, I, would, I that, thought that, about that. Yeah, the Varus Grand Center is a fan. Now, caution, the Varus Grand Center is a big speaker. It's over two I would feet hold wide. It up. I would hold it up, but it's heavy and yeah. it's behind me. It's a big speaker, so look at the dimensions because it might not physically fit where you need yeah. to put it. It is a large speaker, but in terms of value for that price point, that will work in almost any situation really well. The Varus Grand Center with a pair of the Varus Grand bookshelf speakers from Aperion. That that would be my go-to choice. See, I would probably go... I, my first thought is always in, in the case where somebody wants my go-to... This speaker is going to be the one that's going to be the one that, that I, I don't know anything about the room or the person or the anything. Mm -hmm. RBH is going to be always my option. So... RBH is going to have something that you're going to be able to choose. A couple of bookshelves in the center channel, uh, maybe three bookshelf speakers, maybe a tower. It used to be, used to be a, a tower and a, a, a nice right. big center for 1500 bucks. It's not that case anymore. But uh, I would probably choose RBH simply because I know they're so neutral mm. and they're so flat that if you tell me you have RBH speakers and your speakers don't sound right, I know it's your room. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know it's your placement I know what you or mean, yeah. something. You know, you know what I mean? That's largely so, the case uh, for the Aperion too, though. I mean, it is, it is. The Aperions really are a very is. good choice too. I thought about that too. I thought about saying uh, Aperions, but... Uh, no, because I they mean, are, they... I, I can't think of too many people who are going to object to the looks other than maybe the size of the center. Um, yeah. And then, you know, they've got, they actually have tweeter protection, which not all speakers do. So even if you attempt yep. to overdrive them, they won't kill themselves. And really good sound, good value, excellent value, in fact. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, here, we got some time. Infinite Gary. First, just to clarify, uh, Rob said that the surround back speaker should be 30 to 45 degrees to either side, but Dolby's diagram says 135 to 150 degrees. We actually meant the same thing, right? Or was Rob talking about a, some different angle than Dolby? Rob was talking about if you're facing the back of the room, you Correct. should go 30 to 45 degrees off the center line from the back. And if you add 30 to 45 degrees to 135 to 150 degrees, you get 180. Correct. So they're talking about from the front of the room. That's the only difference. Yeah, yeah. Their, their reference point, their zero degree mark was straight ahead on the front of the wall. I was describing you had turned yourself around 108 degrees and were facing the back wall. And now you're going 30 to 45 degrees to the left and the right of the back wall. Right. So we, we did mean the same thing. Yeah. Dolby for surround back speakers, there uh, there are the angle guidelines for the positioning, but with what about the angle for the of the speakers themselves, i.e., their toe in? Mm -hmm. There don't seem to be any rules or guidelines uh, for that, like there are for the front left and right speakers. By his own experimentation, having them aimed straight at his ears didn't sound as good as having them just aimed straight forward and uh, at the front wall of the room. With them aimed straight forward, he felt there was better sense of the sound being continuous as it traveled from the surround speakers to the surround backs. Any thoughts? My thought is that you play, position your speakers properly. Because mm -hmm. most surround speakers are supposed to be on the walls or to your sides, basically firing straight into the room, not firing at you. Surround back speakers should be on the back wall firing straight forward. And that's Pretty what much. you did. And that's sounds... That's the situation... Remember, surround speakers are not supposed to... They are supposed to be sort of diffuse sounding. A little you know? bit diffuse, yeah, a little bit. So that means that you want some... If they are off axis to your mm -hmm. ears, that's probably a good thing. So, yeah, so. I mean, it's it's kind of... Yeah, there's no real hard and fast rule. There's no real hard and fast rule for front, left, and right either, other than no. you kind of need to experiment with it until you get the proper phantom center imaging. That's um, right. So, I mean, by and large, it's the same idea. You're going to have some kind of cone of dispersion from any speaker, and you sort of want all your seats to be within that cone of dispersion if you can. That's 
usually a good idea, um, but it's it's kind of just trial and error. It's kind of experimentation. You did that and you discovered, hey, aiming them straight forward, that's where it sounds like a continuous sound going around me. That's perfect. That's what you do. So he says Blu-rays and Ultra HD Blu-rays can provide lossless audios and they'll often have quite a large dynamic range. But he's noticed that very often if a famous song is used as part of the soundtrack, that song sounds dynamically compressed. It's obviously not some limitation of the disc format itself. So why is this the case? Do creators not care that so many of these songs sound awful and flat? Uh, so many of these creators don't have access to the original masters mm. <laughs> nor would any studio ever give them access to the original masters <laughs> so they they said we want to use your song they're like hear this or they go go buy a cd because we need the money so you know yeah that they're just they just don't have access to being able to remaster a song for their movie it's not generally something that happens i mean i've definitely noticed a lot of times when the you know so not the score but an actual song a yeah pre-recorded yeah. song kicks in yeah very often it is like way louder you know yeah. I, i'm not exactly sure why they've chosen that that's the way you always mix pre-recorded music into movies but it, it is very common i've experienced the same thing and yeah a lot of them are dynamically compressed just like a ton of cds are dynamically compressed horribly so it's unfortunate i agree with you it's not the way i would like it to be but uh yeah eh. Have you seen Baby Driver yet? I haven't watched it yet. I have it, but I haven't watched it yet. Oh, man. That, I mean, it's, it's such a good use of music in that movie. It's mm. so much fun, that part of it. Now, I mean, I, I watched the movie. I remember not hating it, mm -hmm. which sometimes leads to movies I or that are my favorite movies of all time. Like, the, mm -hmm. when I first watched The Fifth Element, I walked out and went, I think I kind of like that. Yeah. That was sort of weird. I I'm had a fun sure time with that, that one. I, it, it's, after I saw it again, the second time is when it solidified as my favorite movie. I need to watch Baby Driver again, because I, I quite liked it. Though Kevin Spacey is in it, and that's just going to kill it for me, I'm sure. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> So we know, once again, we're going on to Infinite Gary. We know that just about any RCA cable would probably be just fine for a three-foot run, but then we also said we probably wouldn't want to use the super-duper cheap red, white, yellow cable that was packed in with the VCR or something. If it were to be, if there were to be an audible difference, what would it be? Interference. You would, it would, it would, you would hear something like crackling or something like that. It's the number one culprit. That's when you basically yeah. have no shielding. Um, yeah. Uh, the other thing it could be so that about the only thing that a wire will normally do to an audio signal is attenuate the high frequencies. The highest yeah. frequencies will be quieter than they should be. And that can be due to high resistance, high impedance, or high capacitance. They all have the same effect. They affect right. the high frequencies and make them quieter than they ought to be. So those would be the things that uh, you could potentially hear a difference. So Jeremy... Jeremy is waiting for true 4K resolution projectors to come down in price. So in the meantime, he bought a used Vizio M65D TV for daytime use in the Epson Pro G5450 uh 920 1920 by 1200 projector for movies at night he plans to install a diy 2.39 to 1 aspect ratio screen so he's curious about using an anamorphic lens the projector itself does not have a vertical stretch mode so he would need both a lens and a video processor and he wants them both to be inexpensive and he's fine with used mm. obviously so he'll be, he'll be connecting a roku and xbox one and an htpc what would we recommend uh, DVDO was like the processor of standalone processor of choice for many, many, many years and many moons ago. And uh, if you can find a used one of their many, many, many things that are out there, DVDO Edge. Uh, yeah, the Edge. The Edge was the last big one that I remember that was sort of almost consumer level. They, but uh, that would be that would be the first name that would come to my mind um, as far as video processing is concerned. Yeah, uh, although he's got an M65, which means like, so that's a 4K HDR TV, and then his right. projector is basically 1080p. I mean, it's, well, it's 16 by 10, so it's 1920 by 1200. So there's a little bit of an issue here because one display is 4K and HDR, and the other one is not. So well, listen, I mean, if he's, if he's willing to go cheap and DIY and everything else, he might be just, hey, unplug the cable <laughs> to the, to the uh, projector whenever you're using the the TV and vice versa, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's just the, the way people have been doing it recently is uh, they've been getting an OPPO. And because the OPPO has an HDMI right. input and it has a great video scaler with vertical stretch as one of the options. 
So yeah. you can put everything into your AV receiver, send your AV receiver's single output into your OPPO player, uh, the right. OPPO player's input, and then that acts as your video scaler. Now, yeah. that's still a $550 player, so it's not exactly cheap. Um, and they're not going to get any cheaper. <laughs> probably <laughs> not. I, they, yeah. yeah the, <laughs> uh, but that that's kind of been the modern way that, that a lot of people have been doing it. Um, okay, so what would we recommend? I would recommend not using an anamorphic lens. I mean, really, that is genuinely my 100% recommendation to you. Just zoom the projector in enough that it fills the width of your screen. And then, yes, you will have some of the image being projected above and below the screen. Right. Um, I mean, should he even be... I mean, it's a DIY screen. He can make it any aspect ratio he wants. Should he make it 2.39 to 1? I mean, it's that's going to be okay for CinemaScope movies. But if you're watching any movies that are 1.85 to 1 or 16 by 9 or any you know, thing that isn't CinemaScope... Um, well, you know my feelings on this subject, which I know. is just have the 16 by 9. Just get a 16 I have no by 9 idea. screen. Live just, with the black just, bars. And live with the black bars. I, I, I just... I, I don't understand why you would do anything else. If you're going to DIY a screen... DIY two of them, you know what I mean? <laughs> just just <laughs> DIY, DIY a second one for the, the couple of times a year you're watching that two point three five, yeah, three five double three, whatever this. I'm tired. Yeah, uh, you know that 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 would be me. But hey, no, I mean re really genuinely to you, uh, going for an inexpensive anamorphic lens is not a great idea. Um, anamorphic lenses aren't inexpensive. <laughs> you know, the, no, and even a used you know one, I mean? it's. Yeah. I mean, he yeah. said that he got this TV and this projector together used for like a thousand dollars. Yeah. I mean, like the cheapest anamorphic lens I've seen out there is like fifteen hundred dollars to start with. And it has problems, you know, it has chromatic aberrations, it has some geometry issues. I'm like no, just don't just, do it. Just just yeah, just do a sixteen by nine and yeah. call it good. I mean, if you want the cinemascope screen, I'm fine with that. Just you know, physically move the projector closer or zoom it in to fill the width of the screen and just have the black bars being projected above and below the physical screen. It really is what I recommend. Yeah. Jeff. Do we have time for this? Oh, oh yeah. We got lots of time. Yeah, we got 20 minutes mind. since we started late. Nope. <laughs> Jeff. Right now, Jeff has a 1080p plasma and a 1080p Epson 5020 UV projector with a 120-inch screen. He's interested in upgrading to 4K HDR, but he's willing to wait if there are significant improvements expecting within a year or two. Significant improvements to what? For the projector? Projectors primarily, yeah. I mean, I would wait. <laughs> be honest with you i think project i think projectors have got a little ways to go before they're going to come down there i mean he's got his budget's pretty big so he can afford a decent projector right now but i th i would wait i would wait a year i think yeah i'd really like to see what's coming out at the end of this year because we're going to have announcements from epson and jvc and sony at the end of this year and i gonna have I, Cedia. I think Cedia is going to be big yeah i, think I really want to see year. what they're going to do at the end of this year I think you're going to see, and I, and I think we'll have a much better idea of what's going to happen next year at the end of mm. this year. Like, end of this year, I still wasn't, I mean, they were like, oh, we've got Wobble K. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, uh, this, the, the end of this year, I think we're going to have a better idea of what's going to be coming down the pipe. Mm. And we'll be able to make a more informed decision. So I would wait, but let's go on. For the projector, his budget is five grand. He'd be okay with Wobble K, but he wants full 4K 60 hertz support, which knocks the Epson 4050 UV out of contention. He'd like better black. 5040, did I say that? Anyways, he'd like better black levels than his 5020, excuse me, prov uh, his 5020 UB provides in his completely light-controlled room and he preferred not to see a dynamic iris pumping the, in the light output levels. Wide color and HDR support are also wanted, although he'd, be, he'd like to, to know a bit more about which HDR formats are actually important for projectors. So with all of that, what do we think? Is there a great model for him to buy now or should he wait a year or so? You should wait a year or so, I think. I do agree. So. If for nothing else, so to get everything that he described, all right. So Which is, I um, mean, you know, basically fantastic black levels, mm -hmm. uh, HDR, f true 4K, though Wobble K would be okay, but yeah. Wobble K, that's good. I mean, that's pricey i don't even know if you can get that for five grand I oh mean, sure well the, so the two choices that would fit your budget would be jvc's x590 and right. then uh sony's shoot i'm forgetting the number now vw 
I think it's the 360. It might be a slightly different number than I'm trying to recall off the top of my head, but that is a genuine 4K resolution right. projector from Sony. That is $5,000. However, both of those have models above them in the respective lineups that have better black levels than those two models. Those are like the entry level <laughs> from JVC and Sony is $4,000 and $5,000 respectively. Uh, they're fantastic, but he's like, I want, I want the, the plasma blacks. I'm like, well, to get right. that, you kind of need to go up to the X790 in JVC's lineup, and now you're looking at over seven thousand um, dollars in Sony's lineup. In the year gets... that in the year that'll be five at the five grand. Well, that's just it. So there's two reasons, great reasons to wait. One, I'm really anticipating seeing something quite exciting at the end of this year. It might be wrong, but I think there's going to be some cool projectors announced at the end of this year. And second of all, even if there aren't, then this year's models are going to go down in price and you might be able to get, say, an X790 for about $5,000 because you could get an X770 for about $4,500 at, at, you know, like uh, more than a year after that one came out, right? So once right. the 790 was the current model for a while, the X770 from the year before went down to about 4,500 bucks. So there's every reason to expect the X790 will end up down at that price point too in about a year's time. So I would wait. You said you're not yeah. in a rush. So he says he might want to replace his plasma anyway. It's really only for casual viewing. So the plasma kind of overperforms uh, for his needs. Did I? Yep. I'm sorry. I'm going to be done. If he does upgrade his projector, he'd be... Let's do the other one. I already started this one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> one kind of feeds into the other, though. So. Yeah, shut up. That's why, that's why I was <laughs> checking. If he does up upgrade his projector, he'd be feeding both the pro new projector and his plasma TV from his Denon X4300H. Is that going to cause lowest common denominator video issues? And the answer is yes. Kind of unfortunately like probably yeah. yes yeah because you, you probably yeah. wouldn't want to uh connect one of those to the zone 2 hdmi output because you still need your audio to be coming from the main right. zone yeah and so once you have two displays connected with zone 2 on then it's <laughs> probably going to go to lowest common denominator if using the hdmi uh you know main and sub outputs that right. are just mirroring the signal then it's detecting both displays i mean theoretically when the plasma is turned off, you should be able to pass through 4K and HDR to the projector. But if there's any sort of any sort of low power standby or, yeah. hey, let, let a constant connection going on with HDMI, that handshake is going to screw you up. So I, I, it, I wish it I would, wasn't I would, so problematic. You, you could, I would anticipate, yes, that you're going to have issues. Yeah, you could install an HD Fury into this signal chain, and that should solve the issue. Oh, yeah. And he probably, I mean, he might have the money for it anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, if he's got five grand to spend on a projector, it might be worth it. Yeah. But uh, we're going to fix that right now anyways. He might want to replace his plasma anyway. It's really only for casual viewing. So the plasma kind of overperforms for his needs. And he'd rather just go larger rather than better. So if he gets a new flat panel, it need to be bigger than 60 inches. And he'd want 4K and HDR support. So there'd be no issues when feeding the 4K projector in his flat panel, both from the, H the X4300H. Two grand would be the most he's willing to spend, although he'd rather pay much less if possible, and he doesn't like edge lighting. Any ideas? Does TCL make a 60-incher? I don't think it does. So TCL's 65-inch 6 65. series is supposed to be coming out May 1st. That's when they've said that's going to drop. Uh, they okay. still haven't announced an official price. I'm not exactly sure why, but they've always been saying it should be under $1,000 for the 65-incher. Now, that's got 120 zones of local dimming. It supports Dolby Vision. It supports HDR10. It supports HLG. So it's, it checks all the boxes for it's going to be around $1,000. That's half of what he asked for. I mean, it's either that or you get a Vizio, one of the big yeah. Vizios on sale. Yeah, Vizio M series would be a, the alternative for sure. Yeah, and you could just find one of those on sale. And, and uh, Vizio just announced that they're going to be uh, announcing their 2018 lineup uh, quite soon. I think in the middle of middle of this month. It's only about a week away. So we'll yeah, see what so they're going to do. We'll see you in a month. Jeremy, will be the last question of the night. Oh. Jeremy has been listening to AVR. Or AVR. <laughs> <laughs> Who are we? We are AVR. I mean, that's what I write. We are AVR. Which, uh, that's true. Uh, Who dat? Uh, Jeremy's listened to AV Rant for many years, and he has pieced together his home theater system little by little. His room is 13 feet front to back, 25 feet side to side, but the home theater area is only taking up the right-hand side of that space. It's open at the back of the kitchen and dining room, so all of the square feet. 
in the, in the square. All the cubic feats. His gear, he's got a Vizio P65C1 4K HDR. He's sitting eight and a half feet away, 65 inches, eight and a half, that seems reasonable. Denon X1000 receiver, Apple TV 4K, PS4 Pro, and Sony X800 Ultra HD Blu-ray player. Does your YouTube work? Because if your YouTube works, <laughs> I'm doing something wrong. Energy, reference connoisseur towers, center and bookshelf speakers, BIC F12 sub, GIC panels, two behind a seat, one on the right wall, one, uh, one on the right wall, first reflection point. He wants general feedback. What do we think of his current gear and setup? And if there, this were our setup, what we want to change? Would we want to move anything, upgrade any of the gear? What would deliver worthwhile improvement? Bigger sub. But uh, that's about the only thing that jumped right out at me with the bigger sub. <laughs> that that is the number one thing that I thought was a, was a subwoofer upgrade. I I, I must concur. Yes, um, I think your speakers are very nice. Yep, the reference I'm connoisseur okay with the speakers. Yep. energy speakers. I I I wouldn't be in any kind of rush to upgrade those in this setup. I don't know. Does he need to go more than five point? Well, maybe five point two, yeah. maybe two subs, but. Does he need to go right. more than five speakers in here? I mean, you could consider Atmos, I suppose, but I he's kind of sitting on the back wall, anyways, right? So yep. he could put some top middles if he really wanted yeah. to. I, I mean, he's already got lighting on the ceiling, anyways. He could throw he a, couple of, a, a couple of a couple of little, little birds bird up ones there. up there. Yeah, I little guess. birds really wouldn't look out of place on that ceiling. So you could so do you, that. I mean, you could, which would then require a receiver upgrade, of course. Right. The X1000 but, doesn't do that. Will you experience a huge sonic improvement? I mean, I got to be honest with you. Atmos in here, for me, in my home theater has been like, yep, it's there. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much been my experience with it. Uh, if somebody said to me, I want to transform my home theater to something new, should I get mm -hmm. Atmos? I'd be like, that's probably not going to do it, Haas. But you put a bigger subwoofer in here and a better <laughs> subwoofer in here. I think you're going to notice the difference like real quick. Yeah, that's that's the number. <laughs> that's quite easily the number one is a subwoofer upgrade and maybe two. Um, yeah. Although I, it, so this is a case where budget might be a consideration and I would start with replacing the one that you have with yes, one higher output sub. That This is a good scenario for that. And maybe in the future you add a second one or heck, maybe you can afford two right away. But this is one where replacing what you have with with a higher output, uh, better offering than that bit could could definitely improve everything. I think you've the you've done well with the with the with the placement of your panels. Your mm -hmm. panels look like they're they're placed I well. Agree. Uh, I think that uh, cylinder sub right where your current sub is right here mm. will have a smaller, a slightly smaller s footprint. Yep. And just be taller, and it's going to be fine. That little bear thing will sit on top of it just fine. Yes, if you're it looking can. at the pictures, there's a polka dotted bear thing on it there's lots of stuffed animals this man either has children's or some weird fetishes he so, might just uh, like the stuffies there's a little pink dollhouse thing in the back of one of them that looks really <laughs> super cute so uh yeah this is uh this is the, the subwoofer is easily the the thing i i, I think you've got a, a a fine size tv yep. yes it could be bigger but no eh. it doesn't need to be i think you're sitting close enough to it which is you're getting a decent size image and, and that's a nice uh, TV. Gear... It's 4K HDR, Dolby Vision, all the things. Yep. It's got all the things. So uh, if you wanted to go Atmos and wanted to go with a receiver, I'd say yep. fine. I yep. would be okay with that. But I really think if you really wanted to do anything to make any changes to really improve, it's going to be a subwoofer. I mean, now, really would we it. try to change anything about the layout of the room? I can't see the rest of the room, so uh, not entirely. Yeah, you get not entirely. One and... one kind of shot where we can see what. So there is a space over to the left, which is why he's put an acoustic panel on the right wall. Right, which makes and, perfect sense. Yeah, that's Balance exactly that exactly the right thing to do. Um, so I mean, I suppose there's, it might not be impossible to reconfigure the room, but I, I'm guessing that wouldn't go over great with the rest of the family. Um, I don't care about usually... any, how this thing is. I mean, this is clo this is fine. I mean, the, the yeah. thing he could do is rearrange it so that the TV is on what is now the right wall. Yeah. You could do that. That's maybe, and then and then the t then your your seating would be in the middle of the room and kind of block off that space, and then you got to worry about where your your surround speakers are going. to I just think it's not worth the hassle. I know. Yeah. I, I tend to be in agreement. I mean, e even though 
So if I were building a theater from scratch, this is not the way I would position things. But if this is the house I was given, this is a reasonable placement of exactly. this home theater. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He's not right on the back wall. He's off a little bit. He's put and he's put the behind panels his, behind him. Panels behind his head. So I think he's 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 done the best with what he's he's got here, and I'm I'm okay with it. And good job, by the way. Yes, good job. Absolutely. Well, he yeah. says he's been listening for a while. So yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. Overall, we're giving you a thumbs up, and the thing that jumps out at us would be a subwoofer upgrade. All right, let's do Caesar. It's only one question. We'll be done it's with the last questions. one. Holy crow! We're gonna clear our topic list. Crazy. Caesar, Caesar has had the unfinished room that was twenty three feet, but only eight and a half feet wide for the first eleven feet, and then ten and a half feet wide for the remember remaining twelve feet. We told him to consider a false wall so that all of his seats could be in the wire portion while keeping the screen size and distance looking correct. He did that and also went with our monoprice in wall twelve gauge speaker wire suggestion. Now he likes some suggestion for Atmos speakers. One issue is that his ceiling is only six feet eight inches he knows we recommend an outdoor speaker depot for affordable in-ceiling speakers his other speakers are wharfdale diamond series so we think he should opt for in-ceilings or regular speakers mounted on his ceiling eight foot i mean six foot eight inch ceiling you should go with in-ceiling speakers yeah that is the that is the minimum height allowed that is as you're low gonna, as the ceiling is allowed to be you're gonna get some tall fool in there who's gonna bump his head on your speaker and that is not gonna be fun so yeah, i mean like even I, if you like flush mounted nht super zeros that still got you like below six and a half feet that yeah not not a great idea yeah. um he was saying in his email when he looked on outdoor speaker depot that most of their in ceiling speakers were out of stock and they didn't have an eta but i just checked today and the mk650 which is the model i recommend most highly from them is in stock and available right now as we're speaking so the stock Whatever the supply problem was seems to have been resolved. The, the one that I like, the MK650, is there for $100 a pair. So two pairs of those ain't shouldn't be breaking the bank. 200 bucks yeah. for two pairs. Yeah, um, yeah I, I would go in ceiling in this case. And, and those are the ones I'd go for, the MK650s. All right. So next week we won't have any questions. So I guess no podcast next week. Sorry, guys. We've been sent like, I think two. Two have come in today. All right. <laughs> Well, if you want your your question answered on this podcast, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. We want to thank our listeners of the week. We're going to start first by thanking our patrons, our patrons over at patreon.com, our 58, 57. It's patrons. 57 now, yeah. It went yeah. up to 58, then it went back down to 57. Somebody oh, was like, I like these guys. No, I don't. <laughs> Thumb down. But thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash podcast. We very much appreciate the support. We want to thank Heath. T uh, Ted's wife, Chris, mm -hmm. Caesar, and Ron, Patrick, and McMahon, and Chris, for supporting us in non-monetary ways. Thank Heath for talking us us uh, talking us up to AV Science and SVS. Ted for talking us up for accessories for less. Or Ted's wife, not Ted. Ted's wife. Yeah, that's right. Chris for talking us up to accessories for less. Caesar for talking us up to mother price and Ron, Patrick, and McMansion, Chris all for helping, uh, trying or attempting so far to help my son out with their with his uh, gaming PC and Patrick in particular for uh, supposedly I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm sure it's going <laughs> to it's on its way. Uh, sending us a, gra a GPU or a graphics card. Yeah, I'll say the names again. Uh, Heath, Ted's wife. I don't know her name. One day we'll probably learn it. I do know um, her name, but if he wanted us to talk about her name, he would probably have... That's absolutely you know. right. Uh, Chris, yeah. who also talked us up to HSU, as well as Accessories for Less, uh, oh, Caesar, right. and uh, Ron, Patrick, and Chris, thank you all so much for the support. We, we greatly appreciate it. All right. For AVU Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.